ICQ Podcast episode 350. Does Ham Radio need a rebrand? Well, hello and welcome fellow Amritan Radio enthusiasts to this, our 350th episode of the ICQ Amritan Radio podcast. Supported this episode by Walt Washburn, Kilo Tango Zero Delta, Andrew Cortez, Mike Zero, X-Ray Zulu Sierra, and of course our monthly and subscription donors. In this episode, Martin M1MRB is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, Frank, Kilo4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3 Bravo, to discuss the latest Amatan Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BLY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a feature asking the question, do we need to rebrand Amateur Radio? Well, as mentioned now, it's always our very kind donors, uh, and this episode it's Walt and Andy that we need to thank for uh, helping keep the show advert free, and uh, they, along with our monthly subscription donors, say uh, pay our way and pay our bills for us. So we start off with uh, Walt, who drops along a message uh, saying, uh, greetings to the whole of the ICQ podcast team, really enjoy the uh, show and eagerly await each episode. Please pass on my wishes and good health and improving propagation to all listeners. And you can find him on 20 and 40 meters using Olivia or Thor. Many thanks, Walt Kilo Tango Zero Delta uh, from uh, Colorado, USA, for uh, your very kind donation to the show. Now, Andy Mike Zero, X Ray Zulu Sierra, has set up a subscription donor. Uh, so he's been donating to us over the last uh, few years, but not consistently. So he decides to have a subscription donation uh, to a great podcast and a great team of presenters. Andy, many thanks for your very kind words there. That's really much appreciated. You can join what Andy and Walter and the other monthly subscription donors uh, do by visiting icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. And uh, the best thing I can suggest is, is uh, think of the value you find in the show, put that into a monetary value, and as I say, choose one of the options that best reflects their a way of donating that to the show. And we'd uh, really appreciate that. And as I say, it helps uh, pay our way and keeps the show advert free. Right, let's move on with the show. And uh, we're going to join Martin, Chris, Martin, Ed, Frank, and Bill to discuss and generate thoughts about the latest Amateur Radio news, including more spectrum needed between 3 and 12 megahertz and rewarding young contesting hams. As always, hope you enjoy. Well, hi, guys. Welcome to episode 350 of the ICQ News uh, Roundtable. And tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. Good evening, Martin. Good evening, guys. That was a poor Leslie impersonation. All right, I'll do it again. Good evening. Well, you crashed out on that one, but never mind. Oh, dear. Yeah. We also have Mr. Martin Rolfo, M0SGL. Hi, Martin. Hello. How you doing? I'm ducking and diving, as always. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Over in Germany, we have Mr. Ed Rand, DD5LP. Hi, Ed. Yeah, hi, everyone, and congratulations uh, to, to you, Martin, and to Colin in the back, back mixing room there. Uh, 350 editions. Who would have thought it? Yeah, 340 more than I signed up for, as you told me, Ed, earlier. And, yeah, there are other podcasts that have done more, let's be honest about it, um, but there are a hell of a lot of podcasts that don't make it past episode seven so i think we're doing okay moving the other side of the pond mr frank hell k4 fmh hi frank the evening is good i hope so it's an honor to be uh, just give a little variety to good evening there martin but wonderful wonderful 350 and i as i understand it you've not missed a single fortnight now that is as strong a statement as the actual number in my opinion so glad to be here yeah well we have, you're dead right we haven't missed one in a fortnight yet uh we've actually slipped some extra ones in but we haven't missed our our, our schedule so you're right also in the, the other side of the pond uh, is Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B. Hi, Bill. Hi, Martin. Hi, everybody. 350. I think you've earned a vacation at some point. We should uh, probably offer to take one over for you so you get at least a, a fortnight off, you and Colin. Yeah, it doesn't happen, Bill. Even when I've been on holiday in Cyprus, I've recorded something or 
done some of the background work early in the morning and fed it to Colin. You know, it's, I'm not complaining because we thoroughly enjoy doing it, but uh, you don't get holiday in this game. <laughs> anyway, let's start with the news stories. Uh, more ham radio spectrum in the 3 to 12 megs is needed, according to the WIA. And, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one, as more and more of us are going on to the HF bands uh, because that's the way people want to, to work on Rabbit's Radio these days. There's a fair amount of interference down there, so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. Ed, you lived in... Uh, Australia for a while. Do you want to go first? Yeah, we will do. Still hold the call sign, VK2JI. Yeah, th- this uh, article actually covers several reasons why the WIA have approached the ACMA to ask for basically more bandwidth on either existing bands or new bands. Specifically, one they'd really like to get is the 5 megahertz band to be in line with many other parts of the world, so that's 60 metres. But some of the reasons they gave were things like the -the over-the-horizon radar interference and other interference from both commercial broadcast and also uh, HF technology companies, shall we say, as well as military, um, is making it more and more difficult. The fact that we're going into another solar cycle, which at some point will wake up, um, will make it even more difficult to find a free spot on the uh, on the existing amateur bands however it has to be said that for example on on 40 meters australia does have 7 to 7.3 whereas in europe we only have to 7.2 so in some ways they're already a little bit better off but it's an interesting approach i honestly don't think the wia is going to have a positive feedback from the acma on this one simply because there's so many other commercial people looking for frequency that um, I think the amateurs, since we don't pay for the frequency, I wish them luck, but I don't think they're going to get anything uh, from this personally. That's my opinion. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, OK, Ed, no problems at all on that one. But I did actually wonder whether, you know, we might get more frequency purely because um, other pe- because of the amount of interference down here. And maybe other people won't want it and go higher in frequency. But it's it's interesting trying to work out where where frequency is going to be coming available. Bill, what's your thoughts on this one, Bill? I'm in general agreement with that. I think he has a good uh, idea going on there. The one thing that uh, one comment you just made is is true. In some parts of the world, the HF interference is so bad that commercial services are looking the move. So that may help someday, but once again, if the interference is so bad to chase them off, you know, what are we going to do with it? The one thing that the article did mention is that the ACMA did identify some um, work items for the amateur services. Continue work on the non-assigned amateur service licensing review. Is that, refresh my memory, Ed, is that is that the folks visiting Australia get that get call signs for temporary visits? No, no. That's, they want to change the actual way that the licensing works. It's, at the moment in Australia, you pay for a license, you pass an exam to get the license, pay every year. The alternative method is they basically package in the amateur licensing with some other licenses like the marine licenses and others. And there was talk that it might then become a free license for the amateurs or a reduced price. Uh, logistically, in, their, in the ACMA's business systems, changing the, the way the licenses are handled would save them work and therefore money. There has been a survey in Australia, and it appears the outstand, outstanding result of that is what I also believe, which is that it's not a good idea to change from what's there at present. Uh, you've always got the, the problem is if you end up with a free license, why should you expect any service in return for not paying anything? So the way it stands at the moment, um, amateur radio enthusiasts are actually customers 
of the ACMA and therefore have the right of a customer to request things. If the license became free, still requiring a exam to be passed before you can get it, but no actual annual fee, then they could, in my opinion, quite rightly say, you're not paying us, uh, we're not going to do anything for you. So, uh, yeah, all in all, that's what they're trying to do is change the class of the license or they've, they've proposed it as part of their uh, five-year plan and that's still up in discussion. That's why it was mentioned in the article. It's another point that's still going on, as is the point of whether they, the amateur radio uh, in amateur radio enthusiasts in Australia may at some point get one kilowatt rather than the 400 watt maximum. So there's a couple of things going on in there at the same time. That was the other thing I was going to mention. Review the arrangements for the amateur service stations operating at increased tra- transmitter power. I assume that was the one kilowatt thing. Yeah. They had a trial period of, I think it was almost 12 months, 11 months or something, back about seven years ago. And when I was still there and I actually took, uh, I actually applied for and got a one kilowatt license in Australia. And they also then from that wanted reports, uh, they wanted you to prove that you knew how to check the EMF, um, similar to what's now become a requirement in, uh, in the US actually. Oh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Uh, now it's become, uh, the requirement was always there in the US, but now people need to do the reviews if they ever change anything in their, in their stations. And uh, the result uh, was the feeling from the ACMA back seven, eight years ago was that the amateurs didn't really understand enough about safe distance EMF regs. And the ones that they surveyed uh, randomly did not give back the level of knowledge on RF safety that they wanted to have. And hence, at that time, they decided not to allow one kilowatt after the end of the test. Whether that's now changed, that's what the discussions are going on about at the moment. Yeah. Either way, I think my point is is that based on what they're doing for their five-year review, they, they already got enough work to do before, before the WIA can ask for anything else. That's a pretty pretty uh, formidable task and that's all i have yeah, to say but it, but it but it does at least show that they're communicating which is good uh, that the acma is talking about possibly doing things with the wia but historically it's been very difficult to get any changes except where it's actually benefited the business systems of the acma which makes sense yeah interesting guys interesting mine if uh, Australia get, uh, if, if they do get more frequencies, does that mean uh, you'll be trying to contact them in the sunspot cycle? I'll give it a go. I mean, I've, I've never worked Australia on HF before. I've, I've, I've called many times. I've had M0 question mark. That may have been to me. That may not have been. I've spoken to them many times on D-Star, Fusion. Uh, on our talk group, we speak to Phil quite often, but... Never on HF, but uh, it is one of these things I'd, I'd like to achieve one day. I think Whisper's done it a few times. It's fairly easy to do on Whisper, but um, not with phone anyway. But for the point of view of more spectrum in 3 to 12 megahertz, I think Zed mentioned good luck. Much of this caused military broadcast. I think there's marine stuff in there, aviation. I wonder if HF is as valuable as spectrum, say, is at 700 megahertz. That, I mean, that, that kind of spectrum in the UK goes for stupid amounts of money. I'm guessing with Australia being a wider area, HF has more commercial uses and stuff, and so not not just spot frequencies, but you know portions of the band probably worth a lot. We mentioned interference, I think, from over horizon radar. Assuming, of course, that those services are allowed to be there, surely when the solar cycle picks up, and I think we are heading towards an increase in the solar cycle, surely that's going to interfere with the over horizon stuff and the commercial services that are there, so maybe they would be wanting to move anyway. You know, okay, it mentions the story they're going to bring into line or looking to bring into line with international allocations as, you know, and if that's 60 metres, yeah, fine, okay, I understand that if they haven't got that at the moment. Are they looking to bring other bands in? I don't, I don't know how different other bands are because if they're looking to bring, say, for example, 40 metres into line with international allocations, that would technically be losing spectrum because we you know we go down to 7.2 and uh, the only other thing i think on this is 
if people are going to get more bands, more more modes, whatever, are people then going to have to expand their radios? Because that little ping you're hearing is the sound of warranties being voided all over Australia. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did it uh, in the UK when uh, we changed uh, the 40 meter band from 7 to 7.1 to f- up to 7 to 7.2 a good few years ago, about 15 years ago. Dealers did it. They'll be rubbing their hands together, Martin, if it does involve uh, hardware changes. So yeah, don't man. worry about that one. Uh, Chris, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, this is exactly the reason why we have national societies and we pay our subs is to, for them to represent us, to, to, to fight for us. So it's great that the, the WIA are, are doing this. You know, they're actually doing what, what their members you know, want them to do. So I think it's, it's a good reason to support a national society. Yeah, that's another good point. That's a very good point. All I wanted to jump in, actually, is uh, uh, for Martin, really, and also for the listeners. 20 metres at the moment, around 0700 UTC, 8 a.m. in the UK, and you're going to hear uh, VKs, ZLs. Uh, a little bit earlier, half an hour earlier, you'll work them. Or you'll have a chance of working them via grey line, uh, but otherwise it's going to be a long path, and... I actually worked into Victoria on the second, what's that, three days ago. You know, um, it, the band is already getting better, is what I want to say. And communication from the UK and or Europe into VK on the HF bands at the moment is good. And that's also one of the reasons they're getting all this extra uh, interference of over-the-horizon radar, of course, from, from China, from Indonesia, from everywhere into Australia and hence some of the problems the WIA were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Frank, have we left you anything to say on this one? Oh, you know me. I bet I can find something. I do have a question for Ed. Ed, what's the the tax structure like in Australia? And by that, I mean personal income tax, sales tax, things like that. Is it How does that compare to, say, Germany or United Kingdom or U.S.? Income tax is higher. Purchase tax or VAT, if you like, is about the same as Germany. Uh, US, I can't comment on. I don't know. Well, here, here's, I just wanted you to confirm that they have them because here's an argument I would make. And, and here's an argument I would make that commercial interests are very often treated differently with respect to government services than individual citizens. And so I respect your comment about they're not paying for it. Well, they're not paying for it as a fee for service, but they are paying for it in their general tax structure. And that's very often a distinction, you know, that is made for a private citizen versus a company. Your points, your point is well taken. I'm, I'm not, I'm not arguing the point. I just wanted to give a plug that, in fact, individual ham as individuals, not someone who works at a business, are in fact paying. Uh, in general, to to support government services, and typically, uh, the RF space has been has been seen, you know, as a public good, if you will. That's eroded a bit, particularly in the states here, as Bill Barnes would probably agree with with high dollar cellular interest. You know that that argument has uh, has eroded some. That was one thing I wanted to just recognize about this. The second thing is I'm looking at a population density of Australia, and Australia is a huge country landmass-wise, but they are an exceptionally concentrated population. If, heaven forbid, a nuclear bomb took out the southeastern coast of Australia and made it inhabitable, Australia would be a very desolate population because of all the population concentration. And to some degree, I wonder if that effect frequency allocations and power allocation because a lot of this going up in power in the hf band means they're going to talk internationally you know that sort of thing and i would just kind of close on this as i agree with what ed said i've had this little two tenths of a watt whisper beacon and on 20 meters when i when i wake up about 5 30 here central time in the u.s i'll check my whisper beacon and I'm routine to getting 20 meters into Australia and New Zealand. And it's then it fades away by next hour. So it's looking better. I think the Beatles had a song to that effect. It's getting better. And uh, so I, I think uh, our brothers and sisters in Australia, if they can get a little more power and perhaps can get 
something on 60 meters, or they may trade that off as a good faith effort, but then get some other things they want. That's very often a successful lobbying effort. So I wish them well. Uh, since I was a child, I listened to Radio Australia and their 6 a.m. newscast and uh, until that ended some years ago. It was one of my very favorites. Yeah, yeah. Well, that one went uh, very long. and uh, But a lot of interesting information there, not just, well, about Australia and uh, the band uh, propagation and all those sort of things. So I think we covered quite a bit there. Moving to our next news story, recognition for young operators in ham radio contests. Martin, what's your thoughts on this one? Uh, we're just reading here. It says, I IARU Region 2 reports on a welcome move in North America to encourage young amateurs to participate in contests, uh, adding YOTA for their identification. Okay, why? How is that going to encourage more people to participate? Uh, it doesn't look like you're going to get any more additional points for it or an award or anything like that. I don't personally see how that's going to be attractive to anybody. It's not encouraging more people to call from them. I'll be honest and say, if you want to promote the hobby to the younger generation, you need to showcase everything that it can do in a fun way and not just contests. What do young people like? Think about that. Smartphones. Okay, what can the smartphone do? How can some of that be transposed into the amateur world? And then in the amateur world, then you can sort of progress from that and like, hey, I've, I can, you know, I can send text messages on my phone. Oh, I can do that in, in the amateur world, perhaps using this technology. I can send pictures. I can, I can do that on D-Star or Fusion or SoScan TV or something like that. Oh, hang on a second. I'm on here. Now I can do something else as well. That's a new thing. I don't think just adding Yota to an identification, unless I've missed the point, is necessarily going to be a, a, a massive thing. Yeah, well, as I say, it's an interesting one. You know, in, 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 Frank, you, you were saying earlier that that uh, the contesters are getting older and reaching their sell-by date. And I'm, although I'm not a contester, I can't be far off my sell-by date either. So uh, <laughs> we're worrying about well, it a bit. You passed that a few years ago, Martin. Don't worry. Yeah. But just remember, uh, Martin, th there's always an extra table that they put blokes like us with the past sell by date, and they sell us cheap. So we'll still have some people interested. So He's still at the kiddie table with the rest of us. <laughs> that, that's right. You make a good point, and uh, I'll mention when we talk about what have you been doing. I, I, one of the things I've been doing is with Scott Wright, K0MD, been studying the ARL sweepstakes data, CW and phone, for the last 20 years, and I'll a little more comment about that, but 88% and change are from the baby boomers and their predecessor, 88%. So the millennials, the Gen Xers are very modest, and the millennials are just, just maybe, and then the post-millennials, they just did the drive-by to see what this is about. And so here's the message, and I think perhaps you sort of hinted at this, Martin, Contesting, and, and Martin Rothwell clearly made the case, and I want to echo what he said and applaud it. The definition, the cultural meaning, and the importance of contesting as we know it today in the United States is rooted in the baby boomers. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong at all. I'm a baby boomer, and I kind of enjoy contesting. I'm not a hell bent for leather, you know, helmet wearing contester, but I enjoy it, and I understand the competition. And it's, it's addictive. I'll be the first to say that. But that's not how newer generations look at this and what's fun and interesting. And I think Martin Rothwell had great points. We're really showcasing contesting because it's those who are from the baby boomers who are in power in the national associations to help define what's important. So that's how I look at it, Martin. And the demography don't lie. And if we don't open the doors a bit broader, Contesting will die as we know it in 15 years or so. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a sobering thought, isn't it? I can't believe it's radically different in Europe, Australia, and elsewhere. I may be wrong. I don't have data on that, but I don't believe it's fundamentally different. Yeah, you're very right, I'm sure, Frank. Very right, because you do study that. Chris, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so there's two, there are actually two stories here. One talks about contesting and, and, and youngsters. That part of it, 
I'm not sure I actually understand um, apart from it talks about just recognizing that someone is a, is a youngster by ha- adding a adding Yota, um, I think, on their log. Um, the second part of the story talks about their sponsoring. So this is an, an IARU Region 2 story. So it's come from the IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union, and Region 2 being the Americas, I believe, um, Region 1 being Europe, for example. The second part of this talks about the IARU Region 2 sponsoring regular English-Spanish sessions for young young radio amateurs across the, across the Americas. So actually, I think this is quite a, a, quite a good little story. So the, it, it talks about having regular virtual sessions. I'm not sure these are on there. I think they're perhaps on the um, on, on the internet. But it's actually a good good way of getting people to you know talk to each other in different parts of the Americas, both North and South America, and, and get active and. And yeah, it says here that they meet virtually twice per month. Um, so I think that's quite a nice part of the story or second story in that they're, they're kind of encouraging people to talk. So in some ways, learn English and learn Spanish uh, and to make contact with people that perhaps they wouldn't perhaps normally come across. So uh, I think that's quite a nice one. And the person that um, seems to be coordinating this is Sterling Mann, who we've met, but I think both in Fruits are and actually are, and over in Dayton. So we've met Sterling um, a couple of times and... Yeah, he's quite a good, a good. Um, uh, trying to think the right phrase, a, a bit of a, a bit of a, um, yeah, a good champion for the sort of youth in the hobby in in that part of the world. So, um, so you know, wish them luck with that one. Yeah, yeah, good one. Well, I'm just trying to think up an acronym, and I was trying to think up of old boys in amateur radio, but O B I A N O B I R doesn't uh, quite work at the moment, but. I'll get some in one day, and <laughs> my, my warp brain will come in. Oh, dear. Ed, what's your thoughts? Well, since I hogged so much of the last uh, item, I'm going to leave this one just by saying that I, I agree with what's been said so far. And, yeah, you heard it here first on the ICQ podcast. Look out in 15 years' time to see how many people are left in contesting. Particularly CW Ops, that's a- Real key. yeah yeah well there you go bill thoughts on this one yeah i'm gonna take a slightly different point of view highlighting youth and contesting is gamification of of ham radio i disagree i think that in 15 years it will be about the same level of participation but i think the rules will change i think the contest will evolve i think you'll see more multi-mode contests being bundled together so instead of having a individual cw contest an individual sideband contest or an individual digital slash ready contest i think you're going to see the contest being bundled um so that these gamers (laughs) is basically what i'm I'm calling them video gamers will bundle the contest together and be able to um uh, reframe contesting to be more interesting. Um, that, and if you are right, I'm going to be winning every contest in, in 15 years. That's going to be great. I like that idea. <laughs> you, you can't win if you're the only entry. Let, let, let me just comment on that. And, and, and I want to make sure people understood what I said. I was saying if it didn't change. And those who are rooted in the baby boomer culture are the ones who have the power to make it change. I pray that Bill Barnes is correct. I truly do. Because it will take exactly what Bill just said, a change in the organization of contesting to make it more interesting to, as Bill was calling them, the gamers. And I truly hope that happens. Because that's what's going to be required. Bill, the only thing I would say is, will the power uh, wielders, the contest organizers, those who are, uh, on the board of the ARL or whoever th- the particular contest, it's CQ Magazine and that kind of thing. Will they see this and will they make the changes you're talking about? I really hope they do. Well, you know, looking in the crystal ball here, 15 years is far enough out that I would assume that a lot of the uh, organizational structures around some of these contests will change. People don't really realize this, but a lot of the smaller uh, state-run contests or regional club-run contests 
are having trouble because the core group of volunteers are no longer with us. And so they mm -hmm. have to reach out and get new volunteers. Case in point was a bunch of the contesters from the Pennsylvania CUSO party took over the Pennsylvania CUSO party from the historical club that ran it for 56 years or whatever it was, because the, the club that was running it had nobody left that was, you know, able to, you know, run a contest that magnitude. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, the CQ contests, they're, they're the first ones I'm seeing that are getting, I don't want to say they're, they're, they're not fundamentally changing, but I think they're getting updated and streamlined. You know, a little bit of back office stuff here. Frank, Ed, and I are, you know, working on the portable ops challenge, and we got one of the guys from CQ helping us out, and he's really good at optimizing the rules basically boiling it down to the essentials so that more people are interested in participating. And I, I know he's been doing that with the CQ rules over the last couple of years. Yeah. I think that trend will continue. It won't, it won't be overnight. It will take quite a few years. Uh, Cause some of these contests are very, very um, historically oriented on the rules and the goals of the contest. So that will change over time. I truly believe that. Uh, and I hope you're right, Bill. Yeah, I'm sure Bill is right uh, because we don't want the hobby to die. Moving to our next news story, Frank, uh, we had discussion on this on Sunday evening uh, regarding surveys, and you said I'm probably just surveyed out. But uh, a new survey from the RSGB for Amateur Radio, and this is... Something that uh, I'm going to let you talk on first, Frank. Okay. Thank you. Anybody can do a survey. Not everybody can do one well. And unfortunately, we get Survey Monkey to death. And that, that's the company that makes it very easy to do, to do surveys. I just can't. It, it's replete with incomplete responses and, and, and that sort of thing. But I'll leave that alone. Not every survey has to, has to have a representative sample of some population. Many do. The RSGB survey is what's technically called a formative evaluation. That is, let's collect some data from our constituents to figure out how we can change, how we can get better, how we can stop doing some things we shouldn't be doing, and so, and so on. And that doesn't really have to have a fully representative sample. Representative samples cost money. And the more representative they are, the more they tend to cost. So what they're doing is surveying strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats. If you take that acronym, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, that's called a SWOT model, S-W-O-T. That's a very standard evaluation research uh, term. And so that's really what they're trying to do is to just get enough people and hopefully from different license classes and with some sense of diversity of the ham population that they serve, give them feedback. And so this is more of that formative evaluation type of thing rather than let's put a fine pencil on what the median age of a ham in the United Kingdom is. So, but I'm like you, Martin. I see so many bad surveys that I've become a non-respondent on far too many, but it's because of I'm surveyed out too sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I get you, Frank. Ed, what's your thoughts on the survey? Well, just a bit of background on this one. The, the reason the RSGB is doing this survey is because the IARU Region 1 has a workshop planned for later in the year and have actually asked all of the national societies to collect information about how amateur radio is going, what's wrong, what's right, etc. So it, it's almost a data gathering action for the IARU Region 1 workshop later in the year, rather than just for uh, RSGB. One thing that I personally think is, is not the right way to run a survey is we had one uh, that was in all the podcast news items uh, a couple of weeks ago, and albeit it was going to be a great big survey and uh, take 45 minutes to do and, 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 but the results weren't going to be published except to people who actually took part in the survey. 
And yeah, I just question when people do a survey like that, whether it's a good idea. This one, again, the results, I don't know if the RSGB are going to publish the results for the UK one or whether they're just going to take the results with them to the workshop. I hope they're going to publish the results. But as, as we're all saying, you know, survey after survey after survey isn't going to get you anywhere uh, if you come up with the same results every time and don't do anything about it. Deb right, Deb right. Right, uh, Chris, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, I think it's been said. I'm pretty surveyed out myself, really. We only talked on the last, well, spoke on the last episode about another survey from somebody else. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm fairly uh, I'm fairly surveyed out. We've had the expert on. We've had Frank, who's our resident survey professor. So, I'll, I'll yeah, I I fully agree with what he said earlier. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying this. This is in danger of um, not getting a response, not because, not because it probably, it's more a matter of we're surveyed out rather than, um, and this could be something we miss for for, well, for a good reason because we we've just had so many. It's become so blasé. I hope that the region one of the IARU uh, get what they need from this uh, from the RSGB and our members because you know it, it would be a waste of time if if uh, hardly anybody responded. Martin, in the US, uh, we have an agency called the Office of Management and Budget, and they have a robust set of regulations because if you spend money, they they have some say in it. And if you're a federal agency, with some exceptions, the U.S. Census is one that's designated actually in the Constitution. But with some exceptions, if you plan to collect data from the public, you have to show evidence that it doesn't add to the respondent burden is the legal definition that's given. And it's not like the GPDR or GDPR. But it's kind of like that in the general principle of what we're all talking about, of this survey fatigue. You become a nuisance to the public. And so you have to kind of show cause as to why this is unique and necessary. Yeah, that's interesting, Frank. Well, I'm going to just throw one other one in. You and I are RSGB members. I think the RSG quoted the other day there are 22,000 members in the RSGB. Only 600 I think it was 2.7%, I think I remember seeing the number. Only 600 bothered to vote on who the president should be going forward. Because nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that would be the conclusion, if we're being brutally honest, mate. That would be the conclusion. But what happens is, if somebody gets in that the populists don't like, then they just moan about it, but they don't do anything about it. And... It's apathy, Martin. It is total and utter apathy going on. I'll pass it over to you, Martin. I know, but you get this, and what you know when you talk about this. But whenever you're voting, I mean, do you generally read? You know, even if you, if you're voting in like national elections, and 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 this will go out after the election has happened in the UK, so I can say this. But you know, people don't read the things that come through. The 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 the, the stuff you get, and you know, we get it from the RSGB, and I'm sure it's the same with the A, the ARL, or other. You get that list of like. This person is standing for this. This is what he wants to do. And, you know, they all promote themselves. I mean, great, okay, I, have, I look at these, you know, how much of this is, when you read these things, how much of this is truth? How much of this is sort of embellished from the CV and things like this? And in, in reality, I look at the piece of paper and, like, I, you know, the RSG, I don't care who's the president or anything like that. I really don't. So I, I'll be honest, I don't bother to vote. Looking at some of these questions in the survey, these are not new questions. We have all answered these before they only need to go back through our back catalogue of episodes look do, do a search on our website we have answered these questions for them strengths what are good what are the good things about amateur radio in the uk weaknesses in what ways is uh, amateur radio weak in the uk opportunities what trends or changes in the environment could amateur radio in the uk take advantage of and threats what trends or changes in the environment could have a negative impact on amateur radio in the UK? We've answered these questions. They're not new people. You know, you know Frank, Frank said, you know, people are bored with surveys. I agree. Yes, they are. But they're bored with the same questions. You know, 
don't don't go out and do another survey. You know, use the data you've got, make changes, do whatever necessary, and then you know later on that's your time to come back and answer. You know, hey, we've done all of this. Has this helped? That I think really is is the only way that you know they're going to get anything of it. Equally, you know, you can do a survey, and when you actually do these things, sure, you know, okay, if they whether they publish the the information or not, are we actually going to see any changes take you know happen as a result of this? Are the RSGB or the IARU actually going to actively go out and make changes or do things for the better of the hobby? If they are, and we can see it, great. But I very much personally doubt that they will do that. If people want to do the survey, rsgb.org slash survey. Otherwise, the link, as they say, will be on our website. Sorry, Chris. If I can sorry, just jump in a second. So I think in the defense of the RSGB, and thank you to Ed earlier who sent out on the, to the group here the, uh, the, the YouTube video they produced of their activities in 2020. Actually, to be fair, they've done quite a lot. You know, there's lots of you know. Obviously, there's been a pandemic on, but there's been lots of lots of things they have done which have been new. There's been you know a new Facebook group for M7 license owners. There's been the United Eight events with the sort of uh, there's been lots of support for new license holders. So I think to be fair to them and give them the credit, I think they've actually done. They haven't sat in the laurels over the last year and done nothing. I think they have actually you know I think they have actually done some really good stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean. And, and I can't blame them for doing a survey because they want to know what they want. You know, they want to know what we want to hear. It's not always the RSGB doing you know, it. Just it's, it happens to be at the moment. There's been quite a few surveys that have uh, that have been out on the internet, and the RSGB, have, you know, provided one of those. I suppose so. I can't really blame them for asking us what we, you know, what our thoughts are. I suppose so. That's just a little bit of a, a defence of the RSGB there. Oh, well, absolutely. And I, I'm not popping at the RSGB at all. I know they do a lot of great work. Just to clarify that, I'm just sort of saying, in, in the point of a survey, I'm like, yeah, too, too late. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was also going to, uh, before I bring Bill in, say, in fairness, if you don't get involved, if you don't talk to the RSGB, then your perception is probably 10 years ago. There's a hell of a lot going on at the moment. I mean, in fairness, just because I talk to uh, people at the RSGB quite regularly, the new president, Stuart Bryant, I've known best part of 18, 19 years. I often see him at rallies. Really good guy. I think uh, he'll do as proud as president. Equally, from the business side, Heather, the marketing manager, we're now far more working closely with her. She is able now to send us uh, information out. All right, I apologise, Heather, you don't always get it to us in our um, cycle of publicity, but we try very hard if you do, and it's worth going out. And Steve Thomas, the general manager, we have an agreement now that we sit down and talk with Steve and uh, various people from the RSGB every, every three months. But there is a lot going on. I think what we're saying is, uh, uh, and I'll pass it to you in a minute, Bill, the RSGB are taking a bit of flack over this, which is something they've been asked to do by the uh, IARU. So, um, don't know. I, I'll defend the RSGB on this one. Uh, over to you, Bill. Okay, let's see here. What's your name? WC3B. Are you an RSGB member? No. What three strengths are of amateur? What are the three strengths of amateur radio in the UK? ICQpodcast.com. What are three weaknesses of amateur radio? I don't like your prime minister. What three opportunities? <laughs> I'm joking here, of course, but it's it's a six question. Oh no, we, oh, we don't we don't like him either. It's fine. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I want I want to upset anybody. It's a six question survey. I unfortunately filled out that 45 minute survey Edmonds <laughs> sent around, <laughs> and. I kept going through it and going, this thing will never end. This is six questions. It, it, it's, a, it's a good one, guys. Just fill it out, please. Help, help, help them out a little bit. But, but they say only if you live in the UK. I mean, I'm a member, but I, I couldn't fill it out because I don't live in the UK. Oh, I must be. Oh, I'm VPN in. That's why. <laughs> I can give you a VPN into my, my, uh, my server, Frank, if you like, so you could Yeah, we'll sort you out. 
Well, the, the questions are UK centric. It does say, you know, what are the three strengths, the three weaknesses of amateur radio in the UK? It talks about what opportunities are there that amateur radio in the UK could take take advantage of. So it's very much a UK centric uh, survey. Looking but at but I do think they do say, unless I just misread that. Uh, if you live in the UK, please respond to it. So, because I because I was yeah. going to do it. They did say the AIRU has reached out to all national bodies, so surely the ARRL and you know everyone else should be pushing the thing something out. No, no, it's an AIRU Region One. Oh yeah. So the D so the DARC I presume will do one at some point as well. They should do it. They should do. Well, we'll see how it all goes, I think, guys, and go from there. Let's move on to the next one. Online amateur radio training in Germany. Now, Ed, you did say that uh, you're a bit that Germany's a little bit late to the the table on this one, but at least they're doing online training. And I'll pass it to you first, see as you live in Germany, Ed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's there's two things about this story which makes it not so interesting or important to me personally the first one obviously i don't i've got my license but it it's not really news that a national society or a group of amateurs in a country can do online training for the licenses this is something we should now be expecting to be normal in the uk you've been able to do online training for three years four years in the US as well, training has always been online uh, and available for several years. The fact that only now that the, the getting around to doing it in Germany is really a reflection that it should have been there before. However, I suspect the reason that it has taken so long is because people have said, and this is my second point, what's the point of doing online training if you can't take an online exam, there is no law, no online examination capability in Germany. You have to wait until the regulator has its scheduled in-person exams, which aren't running at the moment because of COVID. And they, I don't know if they're every three months or every two months. It's not run by amateurs or by the National Society or anything like that. It's run by the actual regulator of the exams. So online training, yes, it's a nice plus, especially if you can't do it in club rooms because of COVID. It should have been uh, available a lot earlier, like it has been in other countries, uh, in my opinion. And let's hope that they can get online examinations as well. Then it would make a lot of sense to have online training and online examinations. But at the moment, without online examinations, the value of the online training is limited, in my opinion. Well, something's better than nothing, Ed. Let's be honest about it. Chris, you did your full license with online training. What did you think? I thought it was extremely good. I think the problem we've got with the, the full license, it's a quite a big commitment. You know, we run, or we have run in the past, amateur radio training courses. Okay, the foundation license is, is kind of a weekend of training plus one day of revision in the exam. The, the intermediate was six days training plus the exam. And uh, having spoken to a few folks about that, the new, uh, the new um, syllabus, that's probably more like eight or nine days of training now. And that's quite a commitment for a training team to do. It's quite a commitment for the, the um, candidates to, uh, to commit to. You know, we struggle to get people to turn up on six days. I think you'd agree, Martin. Uh, every time, you know, people always have something, you know, there's, there's always at least one day where they couldn't make it because they had to, for, you know, for whatever reason. Now, the f full license is significantly more than that, and that's a significantly bigger problem. Doing it online makes that a, a little bit easier because you're not having to say, I've got to turn up physically at a particular place and time. Um, you know, you can almost, not quite at your own pace, but but you can you can fit it around your life a lot easier. And uh, certainly, and I'm going to big, give a big plug now for the Bath-based advanced distance learning team. So uh, Steve Hartley and, uh, and the guys that, that run that do an amazing job. And for that matter, Essex Ham, although I've not done the Essex Ham training, I know they've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I hear they have, again, some really, really good training that they provide for the, the foundation and the intermediate license. 
so yeah, it works really well. Worked really well for me at least when I did my advanced exam. Uh, I now, it's now called the full exam. So yes, for me, it's uh, it works pretty well. And I can see it actually being sort of the future of of uh, how things will work. We've seen a huge uptake over the pandemic of people taking the exams and passing the exams, and that is purely down to a the fact you can now take the exam remotely through remote invigilation, and b you can get trained remotely as well. So I think those two things have have um, have really helped, and I think that's a good way of us growing the hobby. I think the only downside is now that people are not doing the practical elements; they're not getting hands-on experience, and that's not something you can easily do, you know, virtually. You can't say to somebody, right, we're now going to call CQ on a, on a radio. We're now going to put up an aerial. We're going to plug it all together. I think that's the only bit that I think is missing. I know the RFTB have done some videos on YouTube to take people through the practicals, at least for the foundation license. But um, and that maybe that's where clubs come in as a follow-on. We've had a, a member uh, that's joined our club recently who we've who's done the you know the few of the online training and online exam, and he's now come to us to get a little bit more experience, actually hands-on. And I think he's learning quite a lot by actually being able to. Uh, well, we've only been out with him four times, but you know he's. You can see that he's. You know when he actually gets to play with an actual radio and get on the air. That's the bit where he's not had that that experience, and that's where clubs can can help. Certainly is, Chris. Certainly is. Bill, what's your thoughts on it? I know it's uh, you're in the US and this is uh, Germany, but online training. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with what both Chris and, and Ed said. I really don't much the ad. It's you know you're kind of late to the game here, but at least they, at least they're doing something instead of some places aren't doing anything. One thing I will add is. I've been following the remote ham radio stuff on Facebook service that you can pay for it or basically rent a station over the internet. He's doing a program Well, that group is doing a program with youths on the air. They got a whole squadron of young amateurs around the world, uh, specifically a whole video I was watching a little bit ago, a whole bunch of st- students from uh, Turkey took their U S licenses remotely. So they did a they did a course online. They took their exams online. They got U.S. licenses, so now they can operate uh, U.S. stations. I might have mentioned this before, but the the idea behind that that I think would be as handy is you could have somebody mentoring somebody new through the internet using a remote station to at least you know work them through the mechanics of getting on the air once you have the the equipment set up the the, the the physical stuff, you know, putting stuff together, that's, that's a harder challenge. But at least the operating part, they seem to got so, uh, a workaround for now, at least. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about guys in Turkey doing the U.S. exam bill. Because as you well know, I hold a U.S. license. Uh, but I'm only allowed to transmit on U.S. territory with my U.S. license. I can't sit in the UK and say M slash W9 ICQ because I'm not a US citizen. So I um, don't quite know how. I think I think training has to be for the country you're in. Otherwise, you, you're snookered, aren't you? No, I think, I think, Martin, it's the other way around, that the transmitting station, in this case with remote ham radio, the majority of them are on US soil. To operate a station on U.S. soil, you have to have a U.S. call sign. You cannot use CEPT rules to do that. So that's why the people in Turkey had to own, had to have their own U.S. license. Okay. So I, I, I'm with you on that, that to, to operate a, a radio in the state. Effectively, it's to operate radio in the States. You either got to have a, a U.S. license or as I could have done and we could have done is used our CEPT. Now, I'm not sure if Turkey are in no, that. No, you can't. You can't through a remote station. That's illegal. Right. It has specifically, to be US Yeah. It's specifically the CEPT document TR6101 excludes yeah. remote station operation. That's what I was saying. But when I'm in the States, I can use my call sign. That's what I was saying. Oh, uh, my apologies. My apologies. Yeah. Yes. If you're in the States, yes, you've got the call sign. You can use it. But if I was in the States, then I could use the CEPT arrangement. Yeah, yeah. On an, a U.S. station. Yeah. A U.S. station. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is when I'm outside the U.S., 
I can't use mine because I'm not a US citizen. Correct, and I can't I can't operate from here as DL slash VK two JI because I live in Germany. I have to use my German call sign. Yeah. If I, however, go over the border to Austria, I can operate as OE slash VK two JI. I can take my Australian call sign and prefix it under CEPT because I don't live in Austria. Or I could use the UK call as well. Yeah. So it, it's fiddly, but at the end of the day, the idea that the, the people in Turkey actually took out US call signs to use the remote station in the US, good on them. And, and they could only do that because they could take their exams and do the training as well, I guess, remotely. So there's another benefit to having remote training and remote exams. I mean, in fairness, I, I, anything that uh, gets people on the air legally, I'm all for, as you well know. Frank, what's your thoughts on this one? I, I agree with the last comment. I don't have a whole lot more to add. I just I think training is good. Uh, it's it's a system that has some kinks in it, as witnessed by the comment, online training, no online testing. So I just think it's good to, even if it's a little bit late to the party, I think it's good to do that because I don't think the online bit, once the pandemic kind of gets back to whatever normal level is i don't think the online stuff's going away i think that's been a been a cultural change it's going to stay with us at some level yeah that's good martin last words on this one yeah i mean i when it comes to remote stations and things like that i mean i i would argue and it's the same thing you know we've we've said before you know we know can colin operate you know an echo link station or something from ireland with an echo link station in the uk because he's licensed in the uk but wherever you are you know, you you could use one of these things. How do they know that you're not physically in America? You could use your you know, W9ICQ. You could use one of these. You'd be vpn in America. How do they know you're not there? And in reality, is anybody actually going to check up? And more to the point, is, is anybody going to care? I mean, at the end of the day, if you're paying to use a station, then they're not, they're not really worried. I can't see the FCC would be that worried about it. But that's my thought on that. When it comes to the online radio training in Germany, to some extent, you know, I'd say online training, great. It's a great way of getting people on air. Practicals, you know, I, I always said that practicals are key to the, the, the training. So it's obviously, you know, you, you can't do those when you're remotely. But as, as Ed said earlier, you need to go to a test centre to do your exam. You know, it's a bit, I guess, if you've got more time on your hands now, you can study at home, so that's a bonus. But, you know, we've had, you know, a lot of people have had more time on their hands for over a year now, you know, Maybe at least they can get get the study done, and then they'll be uh, a, a little bit uh, further down the line when it comes to the exams coming back. Looking at some of the the rules, I understand Germany has two classes of license: Class A and Class E, with seven hundred and fifty yeah seven hundred and fifty watts output or a hundred watts output with four HF bands. If you want to get more people on the air, why don't you come up with you know a Class F or whatever that you know that is the equivalent to our foundation, and you know give them ten watts or something like that been discussed three or four times mm. and every time they've decided uh, it's not it's not going to fly that was a, a darc discussion point at one of their not the agm the conference effect the equivalent of the conference about two years ago and the feeling was that the what is effectively the intermediate license equivalent the class e is easy enough they didn't want to lower the standard any further. I that's was, what I would, they said. I would disagree with them, but that's yeah. what they said. I, I mean, I, I'd be honest, I don't know. I've not done those exams. I don't know what, how easy they are, but I would probably argue that's a mistake on their part because we brought the foundation license into the UK and the amount of people that suddenly became licensed and could suddenly get on air, amateur radio was accessible. The other link to that is that the, the e-license is the uh, CEPT novice and the A license is the CEPT full license and hence they use the required training and subject syllabus, the word I'm looking for, that is the CEPT syllabus for both and in Germany the license regs and the syllabus is actually in law. So it's a weird situation they've got over here, but it's actually law. So before they could actually set up a third, easier 
yeah, easier way to get in, you know, foundation license or trader or technician license, what you're going to call it. It's more likely they would uh, try to get the CEPT to define that. Mm. And then it could be brought in across Europe. Yeah. So it, it's not as easy to add another license to the structure in, in Germany as it, as it is in the UK and in Australia and so on. Okay. So, you know, the links, there, there were other license classes previously. It was similar to what happened in the US. Uh, certain classes were brought in that were CW only or mm. they had to have CW and some that didn't. And it eventually got tidied down to these two, which are actually the CEPT. Uh, defined license classes so there you go you heard it first on with us well almost <laughs> all right well uh, i'm going to make this one the last news story because we're running really long an elderly couple and the title is totally wrong as we've discussed it previously uh before coming to air El- an elderly couple uses morse code training to escape a tennessee assisted living facility. Now, there was no Morse code involved, apart from, I guess, the gentleman has obviously learnt to listen and make uh, decisions and listen to uh, tones and uh, escape that way. Or I shouldn't say escape, but uh, uh, gain access to the outside world from this uh, assisted living. Frank, do you want to go first on this one? Yes, I, I love this story just from a devilish sense of uh, of justice, if you will. I've, I've had Alzheimer's and dementia in my family, and so I've, I've had up close and personal experience with it. And also as an, as an undergraduate, worked part-time at the state mental hospital. So I've had some you know, a, a exposure to some of this, but this couple – used what they learned with regard to Morse code in the back in the military to listen and interpret the sound into some character. I mean, I, I think that's the basic, basic premise. Well, they're in that what's called a secure memory unit. Uh, it's, you know, kind of a jail. I, I say that it's a nice one, but you got locks on doors. You've got uh, people who try to guard the doors and, and it's all about trying to keep, people with dementia safe and balance it with the economic of providing that kind of mental health care. So you can look at uh, specific units and say, this one's bad. And you can look at another one and say, well, this one's better. And that's all fair game. So they're locked on doors and they have touch pads. And so they basically just memorize as we might see on TV, uh, on some of the uh, popular shows, TV shows, they memorize the key codes <laughs> and they escape the joint in Lebanon, Tennessee. They got out for about half hour and uh, were found uh, on the streets wandering around. So I'll leave it for some of the others to comment, but I almost had a little devilish delight in the fact that they use their ingenuity, even though they're suffering from a form of dementia or not you know, profoundly uh, all in Alzheimer's, but they broke free brother for about half an hour. Yeah. Well, having uh, spent a bit of time as a maintenance man in a nursing home, yeah, people can be very resourceful. Let's put it that way. You sometimes we used to have to do room checks. There was one gentleman, used to love taking things apart and we we had to remove tools from his room because he, he was a danger to himself but after after lunch when he went off to the entertainment in the afternoon we had to search his room to see if he'd stolen any uh, table knives or forks or spoons or anything to be able to do surgery on things when he got back so yeah people are very resourceful Bill, what's your thoughts? It, it's an interesting story, but let, let's try a little experiment here. WC3B testing. WC3B clear test. Yeah, that they're, they're, I just went through one through zero, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, yeah, that's different enough that they probably could figure it out with enough, enough samples. <laughs> That's kind of scary. <laughs> That's all I have. 
This reminds me of the film War Games when Matthew yes. Broderick is locked <laughs> in a. Uh, Locked in the whatever it is, it Norad, but whatever it is, the under the, 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 yes. the place in the mountain, and he, he recalled the turns and plays them back, Shining and mountain. suddenly the door opens Cri- and, and he manages yeah. to, to escape. Yeah, Crystal Palace is the tactical name. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. So I think Chris, we 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 were quite impressed with them. Mike, what's your thoughts? <laughs> I mean, it's it's ingenious. I'm I'm glad they were found uh, safe and well, but say. So, credit to them and uh yeah i mean i i think soon to remember as a kid i learned how to play uh play all sorts of tunes on the dtmf pads of the phone and things like that i used to have all sorts of uh all sorts of fun doing that but, uh, yeah <laughs> credit to them yeah well i'm frantically learning dtmf tones now just in case you and colin put me on that big house in the country <laughs> <laughs> damn it colin he, he's on to us yeah i worry i worry last words on this one for- uh, Ed, what's your thoughts? Yeah, you know, with visions in my head of Mission Impossible and various similar programs. Um, now, what is DTMF? Dual tone, multiple frequency? I think it I think is. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I would, uh, what they've said in the report as well is that they've actually won the uh, sort of the right now to go for a walk every couple of days outside with somebody with them. So, you know, it's it's a balance between you keep people locked in to keep them safe, but then you're restricting their freedom. And it's natural for humans to try and get their freedom. So, you know, well done on the uh, this couple uh, to uh, actually work this out. And not so good on the, the care home. And I would hope they'll have disabled the audio on the keypads now. Uh, I don't know if you can do that, but that would be the most logical thing. They have changed the codes, but pop it open and cut the wire of the speaker. Yeah, or, or put a resistor across it to make it quiet, so you can't hear it in the next room or whatever, wherever wherever they are. Would be a, a logical thing to do from a technical point of view to make it less easy to to break because. You know, if somebody's pressing the numbers, they they know the numbers they're pressing, and and I don't know if there's a display on these as well that shows the numbers you're pressing. But do you need the tones? The tones were really there to go down the phone line to do different things on the telephone. They, you, you know, to type a code into a door lock, you don't need it making tones. So uh, that might be a modification they could make quite easily. Back to you, Martin. Might have been a leftover component or something like that. You know, when they when they did it, and maybe the 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 the, uh, the keypad happened to make that, and it was just multifunction. You could put it in for different things. We actually used to use DTMF tones for travel news on the radio. I think it was five one hash and five one o. I think they used to play before and after, and it used to switch the TA flags on. So it's it's incredible what you, what you can do with just like these these specific tones. So. Yeah, I mean, in the amateur radio world, often you can tell repeaters to do different things, mm. or you used to be able to. I don't know if they probably echo changed. Link, you probably can with repeaters. Yeah, in Echo Link, you can you can you use DTMF tones as well. Yeah, that's right. So, and and IRLP, but it is quite old technology, but it works. Yeah, well, I suppose if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Would be most people's thing, but obviously now they've had to. Okay, well, um, let's say we're going quite long, so I'm going to pass it around to you guys down the news stories are finished and uh, just ask you what you've been up to. Chris, what have you been up to since, well, it was only two weeks ago for you, wasn't it? It was. Well, unfortunately, next, well, just a a fact of life, next door had a new roof put on. (laughs) They had a problem with their roof and I've had to get the whole, whole lot replaced in the last week, which has meant that I've had to take my aerial down because my aerial... They've had to have scaffolding up so the guys can work safely on the roof. So uh, I've had to take my aerial down temporarily. So that's somewhat uh, hampered my HF operations. So I've done very little of radio, apart from on the DMR um, talk group for the podcast. Um, I've done very little radio in the last couple of weeks. And in fact, I'm actually now back in the office and no longer working from home. So where previously I could just jump on the handheld at lunchtime or something or during a kind of a bit of a break. Can't do that very easily in the office, I'm afraid. So uh, that's why if, you look, if you're on the talk, I've not been as busy as I have been previously because I've not actually had the opportunity to use the radio very much. In other news, I have uh, bought a camper van, or as our American colleagues call them, an RV. 
when I say I bought one, I've not actually got it yet. I've ordered one, um, not a new one, but I've been waiting for it to be uh, serviced and, and what have you before I can collect it. So uh, that's going to be very handy for lots of things, not just for, the, well, obviously, holders, that sort of thing, but also for the hobby. So I intend to put a radio in there and uh, and it'll be very, very useful when we go away and do our, um, you know, events where we're uh, staying overnight. So, uh, so that should be good. And hopefully you can use it to, to kind of operate it, you know, operate from that as well. So maybe use it as a bit of a, a remote station um, if I'm out and about somewhere. So, uh, so that's what I've been up to. Yeah, sounds interesting. Sounds interesting, your RV. Something I always wanted. Maybe I will one day. Mine, what have you been up to? A few bits and pieces, not massively, because I'm I'm working during the day and obviously a young daughter, so I don't get as much time to uh, play with uh, my toys as it were. But uh, yeah, like uh, Chris, been on uh, the DMR talk group. It's really nice talking to some of our listeners. It's amazing. It's genuinely amazing and humbling how many people want to talk to us. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember all the names and call signs. There's a lot of time I'm driving. Um, I apologise for this, but if anybody has come on and, and said hello. It is really, really nice to talk to some of our listeners. And, um, you know, we're normal people. We don't bite. So do come on and say hello. 9480 is where you'll find us on um, on Brandmeister. I've been playing with SSTV on 20 metres. A bit of fun with that. And uh, also programming up my uh, Anytone 878 with some satellite frequencies. I think you mentioned you did that to your radio a while ago, Martin. And I uh, thought, oh, yeah, I need to do that. So uh, looking forward to uh, getting back on there. I think uh, it was Peter... Uh, from the cam hams uh, that gave me some uh, details of a couple of really good apps to do for satellite tracking so we're uh, going to download those and uh, keep an eye on that and like you martin i think we're just waiting for the call from chris as to uh, when he wants to come around uh, wants us to come around with a hole cutter so we can assist him in cutting a hole in the roof of that uh, that camper van and putting yeah, flossy's mast on the top <laughs> however it has got it does have in the roof some little windows you can possibly pop out. So I might be able to put an aerial up through there or something, but uh, there won't so, be any So you're going to bolt it to the floor and then pop the top open and then, you know, <laughs> 20 metre mast be a, on the top, yeah? Might be a slight problem, but yeah, we'll work Pneumatic something out, mast. Martin, I'm sure. Oh, Pneumatic Martin, mast. you're going to have to take that, take that whole cutter back now, Martin. You said he wouldn't mind. Oh, I did, didn't I? Yeah, it was only because he threatened to do Carol's car and then bottled, <laughs> like everybody, bottled very, very quickly. That's a good point. I'm sure you're going to mention the car, Martin. But yeah, well, we're round with we're round to see Carol later with the, about the uh, the cutting the holes in the car. If that's okay, Chris, I've been visiting you in the hospital for months. <laughs> <if you would. laughs> yes. Okay. Point taken. Yeah, yeah. Mrs. B is very protective to her new car at the moment. Hey, what have you been up to? Well, you usually expect me to say I've been out portable, but. In the last four weeks, I haven't been out portable very much at all, mainly because of weather, but also because I did a silly thing. I managed to uh, smash the USB port that I use for an external display in my portable rig because, the, as I said on the, on the show before, the LED on it is so dim you can't read it in uh, bright sunlight. And I've spent the last four weeks slowly but surely repairing everything in that. Still not quite there, but I'm close. <laughs> as you take it apart other things go wrong so it's been a bit of a saga but what i wanted to mention to uh, to the listeners perhaps a couple of tools that i came across that are actually worked out very useful indeed a hand drill so not the one with the big round knob on that you turn around but the really small one that craft people use people making jewelry and whatever it looks very much like the jeweler's screwdrivers that we know but instead of a screwdriver on the end, it's got a little chuck and it's got a set of very, very thin drill bits. If you want to uh, cut out, or sorry, drill out the solder out of holes on a printed circuit board where there's lots of surface mount devices around and you want to be very careful and you don't want vibration, these are for, I don't know, about seven or eight uh, euros. They're just fantastic little, little thing to have. The other thing I found as well, because my eyesight's not that brilliant, and I've got all the magnifying glass and the uh, illuminated one and the, the big glasses you put on, etc., etc., I found something that's miles better. You get what you call now a digital microscope. And what it is, it's a webcam on a stand and also with like a four inch CD uh, display on the top. 
And th these things, they claim to be either a thousand or sixteen hundred times. You know, I read this and I thought, yeah, right. Hmm. Okay. Thirty, thirty-three euros or something. I thought, okay, uh, I'll risk it. I have been really, really impressed with this thing. The amount you can actually see, you're down to sort of human hair sized uh, things you can see with it. And I had to solder back a uh, micro USB socket onto the board between some SMD components. And there was no way I was going to be able to do it any other way. But with this, I could see exactly what I was doing. And that was a successful part of the repair. Uh, so a couple of tools there, yeah, the hand drill that's actually like like the um, jeweler's screwdrivers type hand drill, fantastic for, for getting rid of the uh, solder out of holes so you can remount these sockets. And also this um, things that they call digital microscope. Really, the two, two tools that I've added to my tool set now in the workshop that will be used a lot over the next uh, months and years. So that's what I've been up to, and hopefully I'll get out portable again soon with the repair rig. Ed, out of interest, the microscope, is that the sort that's got the built-in display, or is that one that you yes. plug into a computer? No, uh, you can plug it into a computer as well. Sure. But the one that you uh, can get, you can get the same thing without the display, and it costs about 12 or 13 euros, so about, I don't know, what's that, 15, 15, $15 US and £10 UK or something. But I didn't want to have to take my laptop down to the workshop to do this. So I got the one that was another $20 more with the display built on the top of it. And as I said, I'm, I'm blown away at how good it is. It, it just, again, it's one of these things like like the fact that we can get the nano VNA, like we can get the, well, oh, well various other things that you, you know, years ago you'd, you'd be paying thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars for, and you can get them just for a, you know, for a small price now, and really good value. And these are both bought in in Germany. They're available in UK as well. They'd be about half the price if I bought them from China. But I didn't want to wait three weeks or four weeks for them coming. Preempting the question, Ed, can you share um, links or something we can search for for this? Yep, yeah, I'll add it into the notes so that Colin can include them in the in the show notes. Uh, they're both from eBay, so yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's good. Tools are always good, Ed. Tools are always good. Frank, what have you been up to? Well, I was absent last last uh, uh, episode and just been real busy. I'll try to be very brief. I really just got power back on my home here about two hours before we hit record. We had some tornadoes that touched down in the Jackson area uh, yesterday, and we're fine here at home. But two light poles about a half a mile from my QTH were snapped in two. So we were without power for about 18 hours, and it's just a reminder of just how much electricity is, is uh, defining modern life. Well, I was out last episode. I, I meant to get to where I could respond uh, with a laptop, but I got tied up in meetings at MFJ Enterprises. I'm on the planning committee for the 50th anniversary of the company next year, and so was involved with trying to help put some of that together couple of little items. I finished the first paper on this ARL sweepstakes data from uh, 20, uh, 2000 to 2020 uh, that I mentioned with Scott Wright, K0MD. We, the first one's entitled Generational Changes in ARL Contesting the Pending Demographic Storm Ahead. We've submitted that to QST at the ARL for review. They've acknowledged it, uh, having it. We'll see what they say. Odds are probably somewhat limited getting Something in QST, but we think it's an important paper, so they'll get first uh, chance to say no. Uh, doing a review of a new product, I've had a couple of active multi-couplers to distribute uh, antenna, receive antenna signals to different receivers. And I've been using some from a company in Louisiana called Stridsburg Engineering for both HF and VHF, UHF, and I've had some good success with them. But this is a new active multi-coupler that will take one or two input antenna signals and feed up to four receivers, but with a twist. It has a selectable AM notch filter, so you can cut back on the harmonics that you may get, particularly in SDRs that you're feeding. Get some of those big local air broadcasters and, and, and bring them down to a, a much lower dB level. It also has the option to to add 
up to two additional filter boards in the BOP. And I've got a low pass and a high pass and a high pass module. Now, the high pass module is where you can design your own filter. Let's just say you had a big 50,000 watt station that was nearby. You could use LC from Ton Software. That's one I like to use or others to design a filter, build it, put it on the board, pop it in. You've got your own custom characterization of a filter. So I'll probably do a, a review of this product and I'll maybe offer it to you, Martin, as a feature review at some point here before too long. Looking forward to that. Making some progress in reorganizing my shack, as I've mentioned over the last several episodes, I've added a bunch of new antennas in my attic. I've got two more to go. Martin Roth will mention satellites. I've got I got one I need to add for satellites as soon as I get the rotator completed. Got miles to go before I sleep, of course, but I've got my ground bus rods in. And there's a couple of brass ones from KF7P. A young guy, Chris Perry out in Utah, has built a business. And he has just about the best price on actual copper that I've found in the state. So those are in, and they go to a two-inch strap that goes down to a three-rod ground system that I have downstairs. I'm in a second-floor shack, so it's kind of important to have a good good ground system to cut down RF in the shack. Been still giving some talks to different clubs on the price, performance, and satisfaction publication that's been in NCJ, and several of them have been crossed the pond over in the United Kingdom. The latest one was at the Bury uh, Amateur Radio Society. Uh, Tristan Davies hosted me. Lovely club, great group of hams, and just had uh, a, a really great time. I'll give another one this, this next Saturday in Stillwater. Not Stillwater, Oklahoma, but Stillwater, Minnesota. So I also, I'll end with this. I published a brief article on my blog at k4fmh.com and foxmichotel.com on what I call the Lost Tribes of U.S. radio amateurs. Over here, Hiram Percy Maxim gets all the glory, but what I call the blue-collar scholars who developed Blue Lightning, that is the actual ham that he was leading to form the American Radio Relay League. He might just better be known as a guy who developed a gun silencer and helped invent the muffler for the iron horse carriage if these hams hadn't uh, helped develop the hobby that, that all of us love. So I published a map of where they're located, the first official publication by what was the predecessor to the FCC. Where are they? I kind of called on hams. Do, any, do you live in any of these places where the first licensed hams were located? Are you related to any of them? What do you know about? Now, I've been digging into the genealogy website and the public census records to see what I can find out about them. Who were they? Where, what did they do for a living? And were they young or an adult? One is named Eastman, and he lived near Rochester, New York. And those who know anything about cameras know that George Eastman, Eastman Kodak, was in Rochester and developed there. Found out, nope, he was not related that I've found to uh, George Eastman. But kind of a fun, little different thing for me. And I'm looking forward to building out what we know about the lost tribes of U.S. Ham. Yeah, super interesting there. Looking forward to some of that, Frank. Bill, what have you been up to? <laughs> Not as much as Frank. <laughs> wow. I knew you were on a secret mission last month, so now we know where it's at. <laughs> I've been spending most of the month uh, messing with the Flex. I, I did a software upgrade to the latest and greatest, and I hit the internal database corruption issue. So when you hit that issue, the whole thing goes south, and you basically need to factory reset it, downgrade it, factory reset it again, reload all your profiles. I, I did that like four times, <laughs> but I just installed the fixed, the, the hopefully fixed version this morning. So hopefully I'm past that because that, that took quite a bit. Folks might have noticed on Facebook that I had some antenna pole damage from the storm, uh, wind storms we had the other weekend. Got work around on that done. I did get in the email a... You are took first place W3 in single operator, single band, 20 meter for the Bar British Amateur Radio Teledata Group's HF Contest 2021. Send your logs in. Everybody, if you work a contest, send your logs in. You might get an award. I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. 
worked soda stations on the KX3, three on 60 meters, one on 80 meters, WB2, FUN, NK8Q, and a new one for me, K9IR, who was going really fast. <laughs> but I got him. And um, I was sitting in a club meeting the other week listening to a great talk on the GQRP club, and I now have a copy of Sprat sitting here because while I was listening, I joined the GQRP club, so now I have some reading for tonight because that just showed up today as well. So it's been, it's been very busy, very busy indeed. Yeah, well, the Sprat magazine is a really interesting magazine. Four times a year, Bill. And how the uh, GQRP produce it for the price they do to be a member yeah, amazes me. But uh, a lovely little magazine anyway. Uh, it comes out every quarter. Right, what have I been up to? Well, not as much as you guys, unfortunately. I'm going to bore everybody and say I've tried to do as much as I can on Tall Group 9480. I've had some interesting chats with people. There are more and more people still coming up. But uh, as I always say, don't just blip it and think somebody will come back to you. And if you call at one particular time, it may be that as people are now starting to get back to work, there's not quite as many people around during the day. Equally, it's an international talk talk group. So, yeah, it might be daytime where you are, but it might be middle of the night where, where some of the other members are. And certainly, um, looking at my time now, Phil is often uh, in Australia. It'll be something like 6 o'clock in the morning for him, and it's, uh, what, 10 o'clock at night over here. So, you know, there are big time differences around the world. Car antennas. Well, now I've gone over to using Carol's old car, and I had an antenna on the on the tailgate, and uh, well, it was working okay. And then I suddenly looked at the coax as it went through, and the coax had disintegrated. The, uh, where it went through the tailgate hinge. And there was no braiding on it whatsoever. And the, the water had got into the coax. I hadn't spotted it. Water had got in as well. And no problems with SWR. The rig was quite happy. I don't know why, but it was quite happy. So I had to change that. You still had an SWR problem. Your squirrel to wire ratio was too high. Yeah, yeah, well, it was, uh, it was, I had an SWR problem, Frank, but I didn't see it. That's the problem. Radio, and I'm still making contacts. Anyway, that's been done. New uh, tailgate antenna on the car now. I did chance it and put a mag mount on Carol's new car the other day. And I will say that the Anytone 878 works, uh, the Bluetooth version works through the car audio system which is quite strange because you're driving along the road and suddenly the repeater eye dents and the radio stops and the repeater eye dents and it goes back to the, the, the broadcast radio. So that's, that, but it, And I have made a contact with it. It does work. Martin? Yeah? How are you, found, how are you finding sleeping in a shed after putting that antenna on a car? <laughs> <laughs> well, how, it's how quite warm with the heat down there, yeah. <laughs> right. Before she cuts off the power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Last but not least, yeah, I have uh, spent a little bit of time on SDR play just listening and, and doing some shortwave listening. And there are still a few shortwave stations about, uh, and you can find them if you scan up and down the band. So uh, more listening at the moment and uh, sorting me area out on the car. But, yes, Martin, I'm, I'm in safe territory at the moment because I haven't physically connected anything permanently yet. Risky business. <laughs> Risky business. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I've been up to. Right, we've run extremely long, so I'm going to say thank you for each and every one of you for joining me tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, guys. Another another good fun episode. Good fun. Another good episode. <laughs> I'd like to thank Mr. Martin Ruffo, M0SGL. It's been fun. It's good to be back. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank Mr. Ed Durant, TD5LP. Thanks for the invite, and good luck with number 351 in two weeks' time. Oh, it'll be there. Don't worry, we'll get it out on time, I'm sure. I'd like to thank Mr. Frank Hell, K4FMH. Thank you, and it's an honour to be on 350, Martin. Yeah, this is a good one. 
And last but not least, I'd like to thank Mr. Bill Barnes, WC3B. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate being on as well. And happy 350. Well, that's the other thing I forgot to mention during the what I've been up to. Friday, before this episode's released, I will have been licensed for 30 years. Three zero mm. years. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That, Doesn't seem possible, guys. That's going well so. Done. Congratulations on that one, Bill. Congratulations. Right. Well, what I'd like to do now is say 73 to you all, and we'll continue on with the podcast. 73, guys. Yeah. 73. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And that's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BOY. Start from an interesting news story here from Brazil, where the National Amateur Radio Society in Brazil, uh, Labri, is campaigning for the abolition of taxes on amateur radio equipment. Now, the campaign collects signatures for a petition to be sent to Congress so parliamentarians can complete uh, a bill of order, number 5320-2009. And this project, uh, which has been, uh, will, will basically link to deals with the exemption of the import tax and tax on industrialised products to own devices for amateur radio service when imported or acquired by a qualified amateur radio operator and participant in the National Amateur Radio Emergency Network or a member of the National Civil Defence System. So quite an interesting uh, story here of how they're campaigning to remove taxes, I suppose, from the elements of amateur radio, which is obviously for the greater good of the public. So uh, interesting one there. Uh, we'll put a link in the uh, ICQ podcast webpage for more information on that, but certainly a very interesting uh, uh, action by amateurs in Brazil. In Sweden... The city of Gothenburg is 400 years old and to celebrate uh, its anniversary, amateur radio operators have a special event call sign, call sign of Sierra Echo 400G for golf. Uh, so this is going to be a great way, obviously, of uh, getting an interesting uh, uh, call sign in your book. It's going to be operated by the Heinzings Radio Club and their call sign is uh, Sierra Kilo 6 Alpha Whiskey. And they're going to be running a special event station from the 1st of May. So it's about a week in now to the 21st of July. Um, so they're going to basically be available um, on Logbook of the World continually. But no traditional QSL cards will be issued. Uh, so I say uh, good luck to the guys there. And uh, hopefully if you work that station, uh, you can let them know I say how you found uh, that station. In the UK, the RSGB's uh, Examination and Syllabus Review Group has updated the two full licensed mock exam papers. Uh, the, in addition, there are now worked um, answers, PDFs to accompany the papers, so you can see the reasoning behind the uh, the questions and answers uh, that I'll be aiming for there. So this training aid is going to be made available at the RSGB's website, and again, we'll put a link to that for you on icqpodcast.com. And now we're going to head over to our features episode, and this certainly will be one to uh, generate lots of thoughts and uh, opinions going forward, as we are should be rebranding the amateur radio hobby. Hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Well, hi guys, and uh, welcome to this episode's uh, podcast feature. This is episode 350, and we're re-recording something we did a while ago at the QSO Today Expo. Unfortunately, the audio had massive sort of chunks missing out of it, so we thought it was important to do this one again, and I've managed to get the team back together excluding Colin. We, we decided, you know, I wouldn't let him join the day just for the fun of it. Hi, hi. Okay, tonight I've got people from all around the, uh, the world in the three different regions. Tonight I've got from Region 1, Pete Sipple, M0PSX. Hello there. Hi, Pete. Good to have you. Going into Region 2, I've got Scott McDonald, KA9P. Hi, Scott. Hello, everyone. Good to have you, Scott. 
We've also got Mr. Frank Howe, K4FMH. Hello, Martin. Hello, everyone. Hi, Frank. Well, I, I think the the prize for the person who's uh, committed the hardest for this one's got to go to Phil Higginbottom, VK3, sorry, VK6 ADF uh, in Region 3 down there in Australia. It's just after three in the morning for you while we're recording this, isn't it, Phil? It certainly is. And you call me a VK3 and I'll turn off. All right. Okay, I I, I apologise. I, I this is the first time I got your call sign wrong in a long time. I say good, good to have you. So we've got guys from all around the the, the globe and in the different regions. So what I what I asked before was amateur radio. Are are we missing a trick uh, with the public and for them understanding us? Do we need to do some form of rebranding? And when I look at the word amateur it it just conjures up to me you know somebody who's botching things somebody who's uh, incompetent and inept at a particular activity you know a bunch of stumbling amateurs done incompetent or inept way that's far from what we are but i do wonder whether that's part of what 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 the public think the word ham doesn't do much better for us guys, unfortunately, because a ham is somebody who says or does silly things to be the center of attention. Well, that's probably me, but that's another th thing. But, you know, they don't, they don't really, when you look up the definition on the internet, it doesn't really do us the world of goods, I, I would have thought. So are we being sensible by calling ourselves amateur radio or ham radio operators i open the question up scott what's your thoughts i think martin you've, you've opened up a, a bigger question than what they call us you know i think brand is a, a much bigger issue than just whether we're a ham or we're an amateur you know there's there's several issues branding people would look at a brand's supposed to capture the essence of, of what it's describing you know so when you hear amateur radio operator you're supposed to think all those good things about amateur radio in addition to just hearing that word. And that's, that's what brand people do. And there's you know, a number of tools they use to do that. So I think you, you've opened the door to a much bigger opportunity to brand amateur radio itself, not just with a name, but to pull it all together in a, in a reasonably professional manner. And I won't volunteer to do that. <laughs> well, in fairness, and, and I, I, I shouldn't grass you up here, but you are probably the person who has the most experience of doing this from a previous employment. So you've looked at branding quite heavily. I know you have, and I'm, I'm going to leave it there. If you want to elaborate, it's up to you, Scott. But I just don't think, I just think we've got to make it something a bit more sexy. Pete, you, you're mega involved with Essex Hams, and you do a fair bit with uh, TX Factor. What's your thoughts on this? I must admit, I, I don't like the word amateur. That's a word that has just so many connotations that it doesn't do us any favours. I don't, a bit like Scott, I don't really like ham either, but it's better because at least it gets people asking what it is. Amateur radio is certainly in the UK is often confused with community radio, which is a uh, non-for-profit commercial radio broadcast service. I tend to sort of brand depending on who I'm talking to. And I've just scribbled some notes here. I actually, I brand what I do and what, what the hobby is all about, depending on who I'm talking to. So if I'm in a school talking to youngsters, I tend to just refer to, to, to it as radio and just talk about radio generally. If I'm talking to teens, I tend to use the word communications. If I'm talking to people in their sort of 20s and 30s, I tend to go with wireless tech or wireless technology as sort of an umbrella for a lot of what we do as radio amateurs. Uh, people in their 40s upwards, I tend to use the phrase radio enthusiast. And anyone over about 60, I tend to go with ham radio or amateur radio because they probably know it from, <laughs> from, from the historical side of things. So I tend to brand it depending on who I'm talking to and try not to pin one label on it, which seems to work. But uh, it would be nice if there was one sort of snappy phrase that summed us up to, uh, to everyone. Yeah, I think uh, the snappy phrases, it would be a, a good thing. And it, it's something, it, if it's in the public the eye, then they would uh, pretty much pick on that. If I ask you, Phil, 
are you happy with the, with the term amateur radio or ham radio? Or? I don't mind the uh, term ham radio, probably because uh, I'm in the uh, the elder league and it's what we've always been known as. I've been licensed now for 40 years and uh, as long as it's not called CB radio, because mm-hmm. uh, it is totally different from CB, although CB's got a, a much bigger following uh, of people who know, you know, you mentioned CB radio, people get an idea of, you know, truckers and things like that. They say amateur radio or ham radio, probably not so much. They know what's what's going on. But you can't make people interested in something they're not interested in. That's That's the biggest problem. You might try to rebrand it or um, change people's impression of it, but I think I'm taking any notice. If they're not interested in radio, this is going to be over the top of their heads or in one ear and out the other. So I like ham radio. Probably brings up connotations of, you know, the older older gear and, and stuff like that. People look at modern radios and they wouldn't think of it as anything much, whereas, uh, you know, a small SDR transceiver best thing in the world but people say ham radio they probably think of a wall full of knobs and uh, meters and flashing lights and all sorts anyway i don't mind ham radio i call myself a ham radio i call myself amateur radio if it gets rebranded fair enough but i I, i'm happy with the way it is yeah well i I, i'm just gonna throw one in before i bring frank in for his his discussion of this but there's about Three, uh, six or seven weeks ago, you and I were nattering on DMR uh, one morning in the UK, and a gentleman went by walking his dog, and he was like, what are you doing, Martin, sort of thing, uh, about the giggle, and I said, I'm talking to Phil, hang on a minute, I'll get Phil to tell you where he is, and you came back and told him exactly where he was in Western Australia, and this guy's mouth nearly dropped to the ground. Now, what I didn't tell him was the hot spot was only about 12 feet behind me. But, it, you know, it, it proves that we can do lots of other interesting things. It doesn't have to be the one thing. Frank, what's your thoughts on the, the word amateur? and Should we look at it? Well, Martin, I think you've raised a, a very prescient question, one that should be raised and, and we should discuss it. Being a sociologist let me let me look at a couple of aspects of this your definition in the question was amateur in terms of competence that is amateur is not as competent in the execution of say radio as a professional would be but there's another connotation i think you know if you were to take that i think there's a big dictionary on your side of the pond out of oxford called the Oxford uh, English Dictionary, hi, hi. You look at it, I think you'll see another connotation, and that is whether one is paid for work. The famous golfer Bobby Jones in my home state of Georgia was thought to be one of the best golfers in the world at one time, yet he wasn't paid to play because he retained his status as an amateur golfer. The same thing for Olympic athletes. So there's another dimension of of being paid versus not but let's look at how we got here am ham or amateur was not the original word for using radio as martin as you know i've been doing some reading of the historical records about who were the first licensed hams in the u.s and in going through a lot of that the early words I, you know i was missing some literature when i was doing a search in a search engine and things. That's because it wasn't called amateur radio. It wasn't called commercial radio. It was called wireless radio. And remember, in the early days, there was no commercial versus amateur. There were just people who did wireless and some companies. Many companies got into building this thing and transmitting. So. How did we get into amateur radio being called amateur? It was by government regulation, at least in the U.S. I'm ignorant about England and and Australia and other parts of the world. The other panelists can maybe comment on that. So what became the, the Federal Radio Commission 
Then the FCC designated services for commercial radio and non-commercial or amateur because they were not paid, not because they weren't very competent. So let me dissect it that way. Now I'll come back to where some of the other folks have commented. Uh, I've said before, you know, I'm a sociologist. I'm a professor emeritus. That means I'm retired. They, they still let me on campus and I can use the library, but that, that's about it. My professional association began as the American Sociological Society. And if you write the abbreviation, it's ASS. Well, you know, gosh, that's probably not the best thing to call yourself. So it didn't take very long for them to change society to association, American Sociological Association. But yet it was brought up that there was a president of another association that went by ASA. He happened to be a sociologist, but he was president of the American Statistical association. Now, I've been a member of both at, at one time in my career. So coming back to what Scott has really talked about, how do you brand yourself? There are some legitimate reasons to kind of change your name or what you want to be called. But I kind of think we ought to, at, at worst, adopt wireless, but not quit calling ourselves amateur radio operators. Because from the government perspective, that's what we are. And that's where our license says we are. We're not paid. We can't be paid to transmit. So I think by emphasizing that we're amateur radio operators and we use wireless technology, that may broaden it just a little bit because that gets into drones, wireless controlled drones, robots. And hey, you folks with fancy cell phones, you got it from us. Those were those uh, cell phone towers. You got it from us. We call them repeaters. Used to have tube models, and so on and so on. So I think it probably what we might consider is sharpening that image. That yeah, we're old school, and that old school is now used a lots of different ways. Well, I remember when we we did this at the QSO Today Expo, one of the comments came up, and it said. Uh, and it was a bit derogatory, and it said white-haired old men talking about amateur radio. Well, we might be senior people, uh, but in many ways, well, I think we're young at heart, and we're open enough to ask some of these questions. So you raised the subject, Frank. Should we change the word radio to wireless, or should it be mutually exclusive? I don't know. I, um, I mean, wireless used to be the old name. Then we went to radio. Then when we went into computers, it went back to wireless technology. I don't know. Frank, you go first on this one. What do you think? Well, what I would make, I would keep the official name that is amateur radio. But, you know, there's very often, and Scott, you know, certainly more experienced at this than, than I am in terms of branding. But, you know, you can have your formal name, but you can kind of have the informal language that you use to characterize yourselves. There was a famous tennis shoe in the United States whose label was limousines for the feet. Now, those were Converse all-star tennis shoes. They weren't used in tennis. They were used in basketball. So very often you'll have a formal name that is buttressed and the image is sharpened by a logo, a slogan. Nike has, you know, Nike shoes. What's their slogan? just do it. And they've got the Nike swoosh. So I would agree with you, Martin, that embracing the elements and even the word wireless technology is very relevant. And I would even encourage us to do some blue sky thinking about that here on the panel. But let's don't drop amateur radio because that's what our ticket says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is for discussion. Scott, what do you think, wireless or radio, or, or do we just put wireless technology, and by adding the word technology, does that make it more acceptable in today's environment? So if I put on my brand hat, Martin, I, I really have to say I shouldn't try to answer that question. If you look at big branding fails going back in time, the kind of things you find are where old white-haired guys like us look at some data, and we make an assumption about what people hear when they hear that word. 
Well, we're not those people. And if you talk to branding people, they'll tell you that people really close to an issue maybe aren't the best people to decide what the word should be. That uh, maybe what you should do is a little market research, some one-on-one -on -one interviews, some focus groups. You know, find out what the people out there that are in the particular stakeholder groups you want to influence feel about the name and use direct your name change to that group, much like Pete's talked about. I mean, that's a brilliant solution when you can target a name to each group where it's most relevant because he doesn't have to worry about coming up with one word that works for everybody. He's got a word that works for everybody. It's different, but it works for every audience he goes to. You know, so, so this is part of the problem. It's trying to guess what people think about those names we pick. And, and if you were going to do a, a brand do-over, you know, you'd want to do a little research into the people we wanted to influence and how they felt about our names and thought about what impression we wanted to make with them, and then we'd uh, guess. I like wireless, but I wouldn't pick it just because I'd be afraid to pick it. Yeah, inter interesting, uh, interesting point there. I'm in agreement with that, by the way, Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's no problems. There's no right or wrong on this. Um, yeah. The reason, reason I, I wanted to do this was to open up, all right, open up the can of worms and get people talking about it because we can spend years just just accepting the way things are or do or do we look forward and say is there a way of improving our image or what we do and i think each and every one of us is on tonight is fairly instrumental in working very hard to promote our hobby and therefore the suggestion is what do, do we open it up and ask other people but are, are, are these sensible ideas Pete, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I tend to agree with everybody else's is, is general comments on that. I think it's going to be hard to lose amateur radio. It's certainly so embedded everywhere uh, with you know, mainly the regulators, admittedly. I don't think we can lose amateur completely. Uh, and as I think I, I said and, and, uh, and Scott's agreed, uh, tailoring it to your audience, I think, is, is a key thing. So I think we're kind of stuck with amateur radio. Uh, in the UK, I tend to swap it around the other way. So radio ham as opposed to ham radio, because people of a certain age remember a certain comedy sketch uh, with uh, Tony Hancock as the radio ham. So some people will get that. And I also think on a branding point, wireless does sort of make sense. But also wireless has got a very sort of 1940s broadcasting connotation. So I don't think that would necessarily do us any favours either. It does with the younger market who understand Wi-Fi and wireless tech, but the older market would see it as crystal radios and the like. So there's, there's no one easy answer. I think the trick is that, you know, we have to stick with amateur radio and brand accordingly. And I think a lot of it comes down to how we are publicly facing, whether that's online or whether that's sort of real world events where we've got the option to present ourselves differently. Uh, maybe, you know, not sell the word amateur radio or ham radio, but sell what we're doing. A lot of sort of show and tell and, you know, physical presence type stuff in the real world and online uh, show some exciting stuff and what we can do and what we're capable of and make that the headline rather than the actual name of the hobby. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting points there, Pete, interesting points there. Now, let's ask Phil, what's your, what's your thoughts? Do, do you favour radio or um, wireless? Oh, definitely not uh, not wireless. That, that brings back, like uh, Pete says, you know, way, way back in time, before TV even. <laughs> And uh, talking about the radio, um, uh, radio, the uh, Tony Hancock uh, show, I actually watched it this week just to uh, bring me back in into my mind and still quite amusing. I also found the, um, the Herman Monster show when he's down in his dungeon with his, uh, with his radios. All, all good stuff from way, way back. I took interest this week. Uh, I happened to look at my license because I had to send it off to somebody. And the the license that I've got from the um, the AC, ACMA classifies it as an ap apparatus license. So looks like we're not radio hams or anything. We're apparatus operators. So which is probably true because I mean, how many people are going to um, fix a modern day radio when they're all SMD and uh, all ICs and stuff like that? But yeah, the um, the days of the homebrew and uh, making your own gear seems to be dropping off. But 
the radio ham, yeah, that's ham radio. I call ham radio as the medium that I'm in, uh, but I call myself uh, radio ham, so I, I, I call both. Probably don't say amateur radio as much, but if somebody says, oh, you're into CB, I go, no, I'm into amateur radio. <laughs> so I, I take I take it a bit from every uh, sort of connotation. But, yeah, it could do with uh, a rename, but I really don't know what you would call it. Uh, back to you, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's, it's an interesting discussion, and uh, I don't think any of us have got the, the whole answer. I think what we're doing is opening up a can of worms and saying, let's discuss this within the hobby. Yeah, there might be people who come around to discuss it in the hobby and go, no, everything's fine as it is. In which case, that's also fine. Uh, but if we don't question it, we'll never know. Our public perception of our hobby. I mean, you mentioned CB, Phil. Is it CB? In fairness, Citizens Band, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my neck on the line here and say, Citizens Band, there's nothing wrong with Citizens Band. The biggest problem is that some of the people, because they don't have a license, have used it for bad things, and it has uh, created all sorts of problems with people effing and blinding all over the, over the airwaves. Now, that's not every CB operator. And in many ways, I'm going to really put my neck on the line, I spend a lot of time operating 2 metres and 77s from my FM from my car. Now, apart from the frequency change and a slightly different mode of uh, conversation, it ain't that much different to CB. And that's quite frightening. That would frighten a lot of amateurs. The other one is that the people think it's an old person's hobby. They think we're old men sitting in our garden or back garden sheds or backyard sheds communicating in Morse code. They think, well, why do I need to bother? Because I can have a mo mobile phone to do this, you know, or I can talk around a world with VoIP uh, programs like the one we're using today or Skype, you know, or the other one is, is anybody still doing that? Yeah, Pete, what's your thoughts? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Uh, I mean, certainly, I mean, I was a CB when I started back in the uh, back in the 80s. A very good introduction into, into radio. And the public perception at the time was very much sort of American truckers and uh, obviously tied up with things like the Dukes of Hazard and Convoy film. So people have a perception of CB in their minds, as they possibly do uh, with, uh, with ham radio as well. But, yeah, I think... Really, it is a, it's a public perception thing. We've got to look at how people come across amateur radio. You know, if they stumble across us at a field day or a pu public event, you know, we've got the option to, to, to sell ourselves perhaps better than we are at, uh, at sometimes. Again, in, if I'm meeting the public, I tend to call myself a radio enthusiast, which the, opens up for a discussion. Uh, normally they might say, you know, oh, is this CB or, what exactly are you doing? But if you say you're enthusiastic about the hobby of radio, that opens the door to whatever way you want to discuss it. So I think for sort of face-to-face -face things, how we brand ourselves could possibly do with an overhaul. I think last time we had this conversation, I gave the example of, uh, of field days where you've got uh, you know the guys with their headset on back to the yeah, members of the public uh, tapping away at a Morse key. Um, is not very open and welcoming for people to come and have a chat and see what's going on. There's a bunch of things that we don't do or that, you know, where we shoot ourselves in the foot by not being very, very good at communicating with the public and showing us at our best. So I suspect you know, we keep the name amateur radio or ham radio, but make sure when we are in front of the public, uh, we're doing the right kind of stuff uh, and we are selling ourselves as best we can. I think that'll get some brownie points. The other side is the online side of things where people, you know, go to Google and try and find out about amateur radio. Sometimes they don't get the best results. So perhaps our online branding uh, needs a bit of an overhaul as well. So I, I think that's it. We might need to just look at ourselves from the outside in and see what changes we can make to make us uh, more attractive, possibly uh, more open to younger people joining the hobby and uh, maybe a bit of diversity as well, getting, a, getting a, a slightly broader mix of people into amateur radio. Yeah, I agree with you, Pete. And you raise an interesting thought on on websites. 
because how often do you go to a website that was written 20 years ago and never been edited since? But you don't know. I mean, sometimes I don't even spot it, and I've been in a hobby, but if somebody was new coming in, you know, they, they'd look at some of this and go, God, that's a bit ancient, and maybe get turned off by that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, maybe we, we, we as amateur radio operators or radio operators, whatever we want to call ourselves, should date the last time our website was updated, the last time the page was updated. Maybe that might help. But there you go. Phil, um, it probably surprised you I said, yeah, I did do CB before I came into amateur radio. Yeah, I, um, I mainly operate VHF and UHF. And very often, uh, DMR, when I talk to you, hi, <laughs> but um, yeah, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, you know, CBs, I have no axe to grind with CBs, but uh, what's your thoughts on the public perception? Well, it might surprise you. I also came in via CB. Started off, first off doing CB, and then I got my novice license, and then I got my full license, and that was 40 years ago. So. Yeah, I started off um, way back on CB, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And there's lots of uh, very uh, uh, great people on CB, so I got no uh, no axe to grind either. But I just don't like being branded as a CBer because you know I, I, I say no, I, it's different. The perception of sitting in a, a a room tapping away with Morse code that's, that's probably what everybody thinks when they think of ham radio or amateur radio or whatever. The perception, how you change it, I don't know. Like I said earlier, you can't make people interested if they're not interested. I've done um, the wireless, not wireless, the lighthouse, the lighthouse weekend in in August. And we have a, a nice setup in a room down at the lighthouse all the tourists can come past and have a look and they might poke their head in and say, oh, yeah, look, look what's going on. But really, do not many of them would come in and, and find out. And we explain, with those that do, we explain what's going on and they probably think uh, crazy people and uh, walk off. If, you, if you're not interested in radio, I don't think there's any way you can make people interested. And those that are interested would know what amateur radio was anyway, I guess. So... Uh, I mean, how many people have their uh, radio shacks? I call it a radio shack, radio room in their lounge room that's open to everybody. Not many. Everybody's got their own little room in the back of the house or in, in, down the garden or in the garage or wherever. So I guess we don't help ourselves because uh, we don't uh, really put radio in the um, open air and you know let everybody see what's going on. At least... Last man standing, the radio room there was in an office and it was quite uh, visible to most people as in, in that uh, theoretical shop. So, um, you know, they did the right thing there, I suppose, rather than having it in a, a closed room somewhere. At least it was in uh, plain view. So I guess they were trying. Whether it's uh, worked or not, well, who knows? Anyway, back to you there, Martin. Yeah, you raised some interesting points there, Phil. And in fairness, I mean, I tend to operate a lot portable. I'll set up on a piece of land somewhere on a hilltop or in a park. And invariably, uh, I will get half a dozen people stop and ask me what I'm doing. And I try and explain to them. And sometimes they say, is it CB? And I go, no, it's not CB. It's amateur radio. Amateur radio is like CB on steroids. You know, we got we can do so much more. And the other thing you're talking about, about your lighthouses. Yeah, people will come in. But I've had this discussion with a lot of people, and I could be totally wrong on this, but if you've got a couple of old boys operating uh, a radio or HF radio, first off, SSB is difficult to understand if, you, if you're not uh, a radio person. You haven't tuned your ears into it. And unfortunately, we don't always tune in properly to make the contact. We're just trying to get the quick contact. So if I was a, a – um, let's say I go back about 30 years ago and I've got young Colin in tow with me and we go and see a guy 
operating an HF station, massive area out the front, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, this little lot's going to cost me two or three thousand pounds to have this sort of setup. And I'm thinking, my son's probably only going to have the, the interest for a couple of months maximum. I'm going to try and dissuade him for even getting involved. I'm going to try and walk away from it because it's just going to be heartache for me. Whereas sometimes I think some of these special event stations, we'd be better off with a couple of handy talkies and a local repeater or even somebody down the other end of the car park just answering the calls on FM, which uh, the person could hear much clearer. Anyway, I'm waffling. Um, Scott, what's your thoughts on this one, the public perception? Well, yeah, that's a really uh, big question. I mean, I, I relate to what Phil said about not wanting to be confused with CB. I mean, one of the mantras of advertising, you don't want to be confused with anybody else. You know, your brand identity is not supposed to result in your being confused with anybody. So you don't want to be confused uh, as a CB or it dilutes the whole who we are kind of a thing. And I think that's all I have to say about that. But Pete's website comment really, uh, really excited me because that website brings people into amateur radio potentially. And if you want to see an example of a, an amateur radio uh, brand that's done really, really well, you should look at the CW Ops website. If, uh, for people that don't know that, that's an organization that, uh, according to their words, celebrates the unique art of Morse code. But if you go look at that website, in one page, you know what their mission is. They've got their trademark, if you will, CW Ops. They've got their slogan, Celebrates Unique Art from Morse Code. And you can see every activity they're in, what they're about. It's a website that can be digested by somebody that's a non-amateur. It's about one page long. It's just absolutely brilliant from a branding standpoint. And I think if you looked at that and you compared it to, say, uh, no offense to the ARRL because they have a lot of things they want to get on their website, Somebody who's looking for information about amateur radio went to a website like CW Ops, it'd be great. They go to the AWR webpage, they're struggling. You know, you can find the same information about mission and vision and values and whatnot, but you've really got to know where to look. Uh, and I think we do ourselves a disservice there. We need a, a brand and a web page that's clean and easy and accessible by people that can understand. And there's a, a second point, you know, I think someone mentioned about getting people interested. There's been a lot of study of how you get people interested in museums that's, that's kind of analogous to what we do. There's a woman named Nina Simon who wrote a book called The Art of Relevance, and it deals with how do you get people to walk into a museum that haven't been there before. And there's two things it takes, apparently. They've got what they call a positive cognitive effect, which means there's got to be something in there for that person. That person has to see whatever you've got there and feel that there's something there they can relate to. And then they have to think that there's not a lot of effort required to get that. And I think that's something we need to do for amateur radio. I'm not sure how we do it, but I'm certain that a lot of things we do don't make it easy for people to look at it and say, wow, that's fun, I want to do that. And I think that's that's the key. Yeah, a couple of very interesting points there, yeah. Uh, you, uh, you've you obviously been talking to my eldest grandson, and he says if, if it's too much effort, he doesn't do it. And, yeah, we make it easy for people, and then that's, that's certainly a good one. Frank, what's your um, feelings on the perception of our hobby by the public? Well, I agree with the point that we don't really know and we need to find out, but our leader, the American Radio Relay League, to the extent that they pay Redex, which is the magazine subscription survey company to do surveys, and they say they have, but they won't release the results because they say it will, they'll lose competitive advantage. Well, I, I don't know who they're competing with, but I'm going to leave that there. We don't know, and we're not trying to find out. Now, point number two, Martin, Pete made a great comment you know, about doing a, a, a web search. Let's just call it a Google search. Well, Google has a little tool called Google Trends, and I've been looking at this lately, but while we were talking, I did a little search on the interest on Google over time. That is the Google searches for amateur radio and searches for citizens band. And it starts January 1, 2004, and it goes to the current April 2021. And, and, and guess what, folks? Here, here's what the results are. It ranges from zero 
to 100, with 100 being the peak interest over the time series that you're searching for. Citizens ban, if it were a patient in the hospital, it would be dead since 2004. But guess when the peak search interest on amateur radio was? January 1st, 2004. As far back as you can go. It's, it ends up in this month with a search factor of eight as compared to citizens band search factor of one. Well, how do you interpret that? Well, there's far fewer people searching for amateur radio using, using Google. So I agree totally about the ARL website, uh, shameless promotion of the podcast. If you go listen to my interview with CEO David Minster and President Rick Roderick, you'll know that that uh, they recognize that. It's a dinosaur. They're in the middle of changing it, but they're changing it to have a back office system so they can track that when Scott calls in and says, where's that book I ordered? You know, they have all that information there. They know that. The, the point still stands. It's a terrible, terrible website. You know, I'm kind of like a broken record at this point. Whenever you talk about young people, got to get young people in, what do we think of? Think of schools. And schools are just so very difficult to get into today with new programs because everybody wants to do it. And there's a whole segment that we could look actually – to use Scott's notion, you want to get in schools, talk to people that administer schools and ask them what the challenge is. Well, I have. And the challenge is, I won't elaborate totally, but schools are one place to get a hold of young people. They're like the screwdriver antenna. You can put 100 watts of effort into that. If you get 10 watts of results out, you're lucky. All right. Well, I've made the argument, written about it, showed data, you know, I've danced up and down and, and waved my arms, and some people may have, have noticed libraries are where in the United States young people are. It's the common cultural crossroads, according to the Gallup organization. And you also find women there. So libraries actually want us there by and large. They want people coming in doing interesting programs. Do you know what the problem is? And I issue this as a challenge to our listeners. Amateurs don't want to do the work. My section manager on this idea that was rolled out in Delta Division said, oh, you know, I haven't been a librarian in years. He's an old white man like I am. And our, our local people know what, what's best for the library. But we're not going to do this. It's a hell of a lot easier to say no, folks. It's a lot more time-consuming to try something new. And so, Martin, I'll, I'll leave it with that challenge. Libraries are much more efficient. You're going to get 80 watts out of that screwdriver antenna with libraries as compared to 10 for school. Prove me wrong. No, I don't think I'll prove you wrong. The only thing is in the UK, libraries aren't uh, as well used as you, you have them in the States. However, it's not something we should dispel straight away. I think I think lots of interesting comments are coming out, and I hopefully, I mean, some people hopefully will write in and with their ideas. Others may just sort of jolt some some ideas into other people to do things and 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 work on some things we're talking about. I mean, I don't have all the answers. Let's be honest about it. I never said I would have, but I was also thinking, yeah, you know, we've talked about. Do we call it amateur radio or ham radio, or do we call it something new? Do we need a logo or an acronym? I mean, let's face it. If we had a worldwide logo that was obvious it was amateur radio, would that help the hobby? The other thing is an acronym, like, for argument's sake, nobody talks about the Radio Society of Great Britain. It's the RSGB. Nobody talks about the Amateur Radio Relay League. It's the ARRL. The same in Australia, the Wireless Institute of Australia. No, it's the WIA. Should we have something along those lines? I don't know is the truthful answer. Phil, what's your thoughts? Well, my immediate thought when uh, <laughs> after what uh, was just said was libraries on the air. 
Now there's a there's a thought. We we got we got museums on the air and parks on the air and so, uh, summits on the air. Maybe we need a libraries on the air. Brilliant. I'm 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 only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious because because look, and, and I don't mean to interject here, but let me just say this. I became involved with a club that was languishing, would be polite, and we kind of rebranded. We looked at our market from who's the closest to us and, and on and on. And we changed our informal logo to hashtag we do stuff. Grew to about 40 people, and people would get in vans and drive to our club meetings. True story. So this notion of having uh, libraries on the air, having an active station, either in the parking lot of the library or in one of the meeting rooms and advertising it, you're not going to come here about ham radio. Drag. You can come and you can get on there and you can see what's going on. I love the idea. I'm not kidding. I, I was only joking. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's, it's one way of getting people to, you know, to see what's going on. But, well, you know, if, if, like I said before, if people are not interested in radio, are they going to take any notice? To some people, it's just going to be, oh, they've taken up a car parking space or oh, they've uh, commandeered the entrance to the library or, you know, you can't, you can't walk past it without getting these people um, uh, you know, attacking you with the radio stuff. Logo-wise, I think the AWRL have got the best logo in the world. Every time I think of uh, a logo for radio, uh, the uh, the triangle uh, comes into uh, to mind with the antenna and the uh, what it, I can't even remember what's in there now. Is it a capacitor and a coil or something? That's the best logo in the world. So they've done well there, and I think it's uh, it brings immediately to mind what it is to those that are interested in radio, to people who aren't into electronics or anything. They just say, oh, there's a triangle and there's a squiggle and there's a another squiggle. <laughs> So I don't know. That's 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 my uh, that's my interpretation of uh, the, the logo. Yeah, abbreviations like Wireless Institute of Australia. Yeah, normally people say it because it's a mouthful. It's a lot easier to say WIA or uh, ACMA rather than the Australian Communications and Media Authority, so, um, which is why they obviously you know pick the, uh, the the abbreviation. RSGB, same thing. I think the um, the RSGB do a mar marvellous job at um, Bletchley Park. I've been there a couple of times, and whether or not people go there, well, I know people do go there because every time I've been there, they've been constantly talking to people about what radio is. But whether the people walk away from there with an impression of, oh, I must look into that, or I'm glad I've got away from that uh, fanatic. <laughs> uh, same with um, on the Belfast. There's a, a very good um, interaction there as well. But uh, uh, good things come to an end, unfortunately. And, yeah, library's on the air. Oh, well, maybe I've, start, maybe I've started something. I should have I kept quiet. <laughs> anyway, back to you there, Martin. No, no, no. Everything, everything is valid, Phil. Everything is valid. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you might say something flippantly as a joke and, and somebody else picks it up and goes, actually, I can just modify that bit and it'll work. So it's a good one. But I think the other thing is, if you're going to do events like that, one of the worst things we do is you don't have icebreakers. You know, you don't have people to t talk to the public. Now, I... I'm going to bang my drum here, and I know Pete's very similar because Pete and I do do a lot of this in, in the UK, so I can guarantee this. But we're icebreakers. We walk up to people. We talk to people. We'll engage them as they're walking up the street towards us. And it might just be, hi, how are you doing? Or lovely day, day, isn't it? You know, you, once you've broken that initial and shown some interest in them, they're far more perceptive to whatever you trying to do are they pete or do you not agree i think so i mean i think you and i are quite similar if, if someone's vaguely interested at an event uh, will pounce uh you can often tell if someone sort of glimpses hovers for, for five seconds and walks away they're, they're possibly a dead loss if they hover for more than about 10 seconds i'll pounce on them the setup we tend to use is very much very sort of basic so uh, it, it's a lot of you know wire up fishing rods and car batteries um, and the icebreaker for us tends to be people seeing fishing rods sticking up in the air and uh, will come over and say, what are you doing fishing? And we'll say, yeah, we're fishing for radio signals. 
that tends to lead down the are you CBers route and we'll just educate them. But the, the best thing is just to, you know, unplug our headphones, turn the speaker on, spin the dial and say, you know, that guy's in Russia, that guy's in America, he's an Italian, uh, and, and spin the dial and let them hear it. Let them realize that, you know, there's no mobile internet here. There's no mains power. There's no phone. There's no cell tower. That bit of wire is able to get a signal from halfway around the world. And that does tend to get people's interest. If they hang around for that chat, I'll sit them in the chair and let them spin the dial so they can get a feel for how the tuning actually works. If they're really interested, we stick them on two meters uh, and we'll do a greetings message. We'll let them pick up a mic, say hello to someone and get a bit of a feel for it. And the thing you notice at our field events uh, is we have lots of leaflets. So nobody goes away without a leaflet, which points them towards uh, our website where we have some very sort of clear what is amateur radio uh, videos. And uh, we've learned the lessons that I think Scott was mentioning about the uh, uh, the website awareness, uh, which is a bit of a bugbear of mine. And we make sure that our website has a lot of, you know, getting started videos and uh, what is amateur radio stuff without the jargon. So I think that's how we we tend to sort of hook people in. But just to, if I may throw back to the um, the original question, uh, logos, I'm up for no logos and no acronyms. Controversial, I know, but I don't think acronyms help anyone. If you don't know what it stands for, it just gets in the way. And we haven't got enough awareness. You know, We're not McDonald's. People aren't going to recognize the amateur radio logo from miles away and come rushing over. So uh, for me, no logos, no acronyms. And at field days, pounce on anyone that's remotely keen before they get away. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a fair, fair assumption. I just think that Essex Ham is a, is a lovely brand. That's all, Pete. It's yours. <laughs> no argument from me. But, but we set out. I mean, when so, so Essex Ham was born 10 years ago, and I was largely looking at the internet landscape. I, I stumbled into it a bit by accident and thought, this is a brilliant hobby, but nobody's talking about it. And everything I found online was, I think as Scott said, you know, it's 20 years out of date. I've just called up a random amateur radio website here. And everything I'm looking at about this particular amateur radio site is is wrong. You know, the, the URL is the call sign, which means nothing to anyone, www.g and then the call sign. Uh, it then says established 1946, which immediately means it's 70 years old. It's in Times New Roman. Um, uh, and then when it starts getting into the content, it lists the, um, the club call sign. The next paragraph is uh, club net is on 145.375. Our DMR ID is, and some information about QSL cards. Now, the average yeah, newcomer that stumbles across that website and sees that, acronyms, logos, uh, and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be so turned off, you know. And uh, hopefully Scott will back me on this one, is know your audience and club websites. Effectively, you've got three different audiences. You almost need three different websites. So you've got the club member, which most websites seem to be aimed at, and the club member just wants to know what's in the diary when the next meeting is. Uh, newcomers that have just got their license, they need help. So, you know, a, a section for newcomers, help and advice, getting started guides, what rig should I buy, and that kind of stuff. But the newcomer that's totally unlicensed and doesn't know anything about it needs a very good, clear, what is amateur radio? Maybe a nice, you know, two minute short attention span video showing what it is with a link to how to get started, how to get your license, whatever. And so much of that we're doing wrong, and so much of it is now all online, that I think that is the bit that I would say needs the more urgent attention. Sorry, I'll get up on the soapbox now. No, your soapbox is very important, Pete, very important. And, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that one. So, Scott, we've kept you quiet for a minute, but, you know, What's your thoughts on the logos? Pete doesn't like them. Do, do you not like them either? Yeah, the, um, I, this is the only thing I disagree with Pete on, logos. And, and I guess the point I'll make is let's go to the library. I'm still numb from libraries on the air. I'm not sure what to do with that. But you know, let's go to the library and let's look at the back of every computer that you're looking at of a person that's age 13 to 16 there. And what's it littered with? It's littered with logos that they think are cool. I think if we had an amateur radio logo that looked like things that they thought were cool, I don't know, Arduinos, robotics, whatever it is, something that's a contemporary technology reference, 
something that I don't know. I, I say this in jest, but only half in jest. That had a skeleton, a lightning bolt, neon colors, you know, whatever it is. An attractive logo that draws people in. I mean, it's the same analogy as the museum. If you can hand out a logo, people like it. They put it on their uh, computer. They talk about it. What's that? Where'd you get it? Uh, I think there's a place for a logo, but it's got to be specifically targeted for uh, for the audience. So I think that's something that should be looked into. And I agree with Pete about the websites, of course. I mean, I've seen people that do a very nice job in other hobbies where they their first client-facing page just has a routing thing on it. It says, are you new to the hobby? Do you want this? Do you want that? Very simple. And it might have 25 words about each one in a big click box, and you go there, and it's it's tailored to the person. And that's so important when people are looking for things on the Internet. To, to really know your audience and get them to what's relevant to them as fast as you can because the attention spans are short. And I think that's uh, that's about all I've got to say about it, but I really want that moment. Yeah, some very, very uh, constructive criticism there that, of, of websites, and I think you're right. Um, you and Pete have uh, come up with some good ideas there. Hopefully uh, some of the people that do the websites might be listening to this and pick up on the ideas. Frank, what's your thoughts on on uh, logos and anachronisms and all those sort of things? Well, they're almost required in the digital age with social media. You know, we we um, you couldn't spell out American Radio Relay League or whatever, and so yeah, they're they're necessary. And I agree with the fact that one thing the ARL has is a very effective logo and those are just incredible tools for branding and we can quibble about what they should be and no matter what it is there'll be some who like it there'll be some who who won't so you know i've i've tried to um use logos on things i'm building promoting and things like that so i'm totally on board with it yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in fairness, and just go off a little tangent here, I mean, we've had people say to us, why why did we have orange T-shirts, the branding of orange T-shirts? And it's partly it was by luck, but also it was so I could see another ICQ present at the other end of a hall. Now, we've been rather um, screwed a little bit on that now because lots of people wear orange T-shirts to rallies, but the, the brand is still there. People know us, and I, I get earache. If I turn up at a rally and I haven't got an orange shirt on, it's like, well, what are you doing here? And I'm, well, I'm actually just come to the rally to have a rummage. Haven't you got a microphone? No, 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 no. I do do other things. So, uh, yeah, the brand sometimes can be a good thing. But uh, So, moving down my list of things, how do we better promote our hobby? Now, the National Societies often try and do their best, but they they have their own agenda on what they're doing, and um, they're also massive organisations and sometimes slow to uh, respond. I'm not picking on anybody, that's just a fact. We also have a number of colleagues that are in broadcast, you know, radio, TV, uh, around the world, that when every time an amateur radio story comes up, you know, could help but get this into the media or publicized or put somebody up who knows something about this. I think this is another way we could promote ourselves, you know, and we have lots of skills that we we should be talking to people because I think if we don't do this, we're just going to stick our head in the sand and hope our hobby won't die, in fairness. So uh, let's go with Scott. What's your thoughts on Scott? Well, if I was being paid to do this, the first thing I do is seek out as many people that I could find that were interested in the relative target audience we had that could tell me about those people and, and what would catch their interest. You know, I, I, I've thought about the future of amateur radio, for an example. What, what would I do if I wanted to chart the future of amateur radio here? Well, I'd probably gather a bunch of really clever people that have a long history of accomplishment in amateur radio and ask them what they think we need. Uh, you know, people like Riley Hollingsworth, Wayne Burdick, uh, Carol Perry, you know, people that, that have done really well in amateur radio, have some amateur radio vision, but they relate to the commercial world, the educational world, the regulatory world, and c- convene those people and say, what do you think we need to do and brainstorm with them a little bit? And I think it's the same thing if you're talking about kids in high school or junior high school. 
that you'd like to get or people in the maker movement. You know, you've got to hang around with the people that you want to get involved with, find out what's important to them, and then, uh, and then start drawing them in that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Frank, what's your thoughts? How would you promote the hobby better? Well, I, I think Scott, you know, said, said a mouthful, if you will, in, in a positive way. The thing that we need to acknowledge, yes, it's the old gray hairs, uh, and, and I'm going to put myself there. I'm old and I actually have gray hair. So if I had a nickel for every time I heard, well, back when, well, when you look at that and you put it historically when that person was born, so many of them were born in the baby boom or in the predecessor generation, commonly called the traditionalist. And guess what, folks? In 15 years, they're going to mostly be dead. So it's great to take the accomplishments of the senior cohort of the president and try to solicit some wisdom all about that. But at the same time, you have to be careful in what you hear from them and what you act on because when we do what Scott's saying, when you talk to young people, shameless promotion, uh, young man in, in Illinois who started the young Illinois amateur radio club, he found out about ham radio, not in the library, not in the school, not by the guy down the, the street on YouTube. And he got excited because of what he saw on YouTube politely he don't want to sit at our knee and his friends don't want to sit at our knee and if you get on youtube and you look up the user astro leah it's a young lady and she's got a friend they're both hams now in her case her father's a ham that's how she got in it that is in the household now there's the ultimate organization in which to find young people in their homes so you know, those, those folks get excited for reasons that Scott's alluded to that are not known collectively by the people like me rooted in the young period of time in the baby boom when we were born. So we have to be very careful of that. If what we believe in our hearts and our minds and for our experience, if there's anything we know about millennials and Gen Xers, that they look at the world differently than we do in broad terms. I mean, I think today that I challenge anyone that disagree with that general statement. Uh, they're very different. Here's something that, that will be uh, outrageously controversial. The American Radio Relay League here in the States is the 800-pound gorilla. They are the national association, as, as they claim to be, and I'm one of their flunkies in the district in the Delta Division. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with Hoke and Mints and some of these other high dollar contractors that come in and we'll do all this and we'll, it'll make coffee for you. Buy some national ads, primetime television, tell the American public about amateur radio. You can't afford a lot of them. Try it once. See what happens. It's worked for some other companies. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a, uh, that's an, a certain option. And, uh, yeah, you only have to do it to me a few times, and maybe you'd get special rates because uh, you're not a business. Phil, over in Australia, how, how do you think we should promote amateur radio better? Oh, that's a good question. Jota is uh, a good way of doing it. Get the kids interested early, and maybe later on you might get a, a small percentage who uh, remember the, the fun they had talking to other scouts and maybe they'll do it but it's hard because they've got telephones and uh, you can do the same thing with a telephone nowadays that you couldn't do way back <laughs> I just said that I just said it way back it used to cost a lot of money to phone um, overseas nowadays with Wi-Fi it doesn't cost so much so um, yeah how do you uh, how do you make it more interesting I guess Attending different fates or uh, expos and things like that would be one way. There's plenty of electronics um, expos around the around the world, but they usually cost money. You know, you've got to have people with the time to do it. So it's hard for a, uh, a, a basic organisation. Advertising on TV is very expensive. So the only thing I... Uh, 
wish people would get it right is whenever something is on the news, it's usually a radio ham or a CB has done this, done that. And usually it seems to be if it's something bad, it's always a radio ham. That's, that's the impression that I'm getting. So some of these news organisations should be dragged in and uh, given uh, some sort of outline of what, what's what. Just because somebody's uh, an, a radio enthusiast and might do something illegal doesn't mean they're a radio ham. That, that really gets, gets my goat up. So um, advertising, branding, yes, it's important. But unfortunately, it costs money and it costs time. And I don't know if most people have the capability of doing it. I know when I go out into parks, I go out into parks that are remote. So if I see any, or if anybody sees me, they either think there's a weirdo over there and they stay stay away, which actually suits me. I don't go into um, you know open areas where a lot of people are around generally. So um, I'm probably not a not a good one for uh, that sort of um, advertising. But if we're at a lighthouse and people come in the door and they show an interest, we usually go and have a chat to them. But I've done Jota. Uh, I haven't done too many summits. I haven't done too, uh, too many lighthouse. I've, I've done a, one lighthouse many for many years. Even the Jota started off okay, but then they started losing interest and losing interest probably came around with the advent of mobile telephone so i don't know where i don't know where it's going to end up uh, back to you there man yeah yeah well it's it's interesting what you're saying and uh, we all approach it in different ways so i've left pete till the last pete because you know I, I was going to ask you how do you better promote the hobby uh you work in broadcast i know but equally essex hams from nothing to probably one of the biggest forces in amateur radio in the UK, Club of the Year award, and you don't have you don't limit people to living in Essex. You know what else can you do, Pete? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. How do I answer that one? Uh, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, we've had a lot of successes by being, I'd, I'd say, very opportunist. So we've identified ways to get us promoted i guess so I'm, I'm kind of with phil that you know press and radio local radio has its moments so getting in the local press uh we're able to do that pretty easily uh, any story gets in the local press around here because they're desperate for, for good news stories at the moment but that converts to nothing you know we, we put in a web address monitor the traffic and it's it's nothing so local press and local radio tend to not bring in an awful lot for us martin you might remember um last year amateur radio was featured on the front page of the bbc website a uh, massive spike in traffic uh, across a lot of clubs including ours uh, but only for one day so you've kind of got to do that 365 for that to work online ads we've tried it as an experiment uh, we've tried some very targeted facebook ads for uh, mainly cbs we tried to, to pitch for people with an interest in cb through facebook that works but it's expensive so really, it's those opportunist ways of getting in front of people. So Jota, lighthouses, even libraries, certainly. As Scott mentioned, the maker community. Now, we're very lucky with a, a very strong maker community where I live, and we partner with them. So they do an event. We go along and demonstrate amateur radio side by side with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, and they come to our rallies and have a, uh, a Raspberry Pi table next to us. So we've got a very good working relationship there. But it's, it's the opportunist things. You know, when there's an astronaut on the ISS talking to a school, we will see if we can get some coverage from that, maybe involve a local school. If there's a story in the press about STEM activities and youngsters getting into engineering, is there a way in for us there? So we kind of look for any, anything that's going on that is sort of on trends that we've got a connection to uh, and try and jump in there. Uh, also, we see what others are doing. So I don't know if any of you have, uh, have seen the web presence of a, uh, a YL uh, in Russia called Raisa, R1BIG. She's great. She's so opportunist at getting amateur radio pushed out there, uh, not just in her home country, but you know across the world. So she made contact with NASA and, and did her entire QSO dressed up in a sort of a grey 
Borg spacesuit type thing to, to raise awareness for the hobby. And it's that kind of, you know, getting visible, being noticed and being a bit opportunist uh, that I think is is kind of the, the, the cheap and cheerful way of getting the brand pushed out in front of people. Question for Pete Martin? Yeah, go for it, Scott. So, Pete, you know, I, I was impressed that you ran Facebook ads. I'm curious, have you gotten into the uh, the more esoteric stuff like TikTok and Instagram? I look there a lot for amateur radio stuff. I know my kids, uh, lots of people are on there. They look at Facebook and Twitter as so old mannish anymore compared to what's going on. So you seem to be on top of social media. Have you, you taken it out to those venues at all or not? So, again, our audience tends to be 30 plus. Uh, so Facebook and Twitter work for them. YouTube is probably one of the best successes for us. Uh, so we've got a, more YouTube followers than we have social media followers on Facebook and Twitter. Instagram just didn't work. Uh, we put up loads of pictures. Uh, we, we tried everything. We tried uh, kitten in a shack. We tried different people of different uh, different ages and sexes doing silly poses. Uh, we got a bunch of likes, but just zero conversions. Uh, TikTok, my daughter, who's uh, 13, very into TikTok, uh, encouraged me to create a YouTube channel. So we did a What is Amateur Radio in 10 Seconds video, uh, which got a tiny bit of traffic, but not a lot. Then we put up a, a cat picture playing with a handheld antenna. Uh, that got about three times the likes, but no conversions. So there's options there, but I, I think the youngsters just aren't that interested because they can't really see the relevance. If they're on a smartphone, you know, saying you can talk to people around the world, well, so can they. So that, that selling doesn't work. What is the sales pitch to get a youngster that's on TikTok uh, to take their uh, you know, entry-level license? That's such a hard jump uh, that all you can really do is a little bit of awareness and hope that when they're perhaps a, a tad older and they've got a bit more disposable income, uh, they'll remember it and maybe uh, you know, re-look at the hobby that way. So it's a tricky one. But, um, yeah, TikTok and Instagram... Uh, we're there, but we're just not really seeing the returns. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's a difficult one and, and uh, some interesting. Now, guys, I'm going to throw the floor open for a few minutes. Uh, and anybody want to throw anything else into the pie? Sure. <laughs> Go on, Scott. You know, I, um, I'll, I'll throw some gasoline on Frank's fire a little bit, I suppose, too, about advertising and, and maybe the AWR being a little dated. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure that the future of amateur radio or getting people into amateur radio is something that needs to be left just to a singular national amateur radio society that represents maybe a quarter of the radio amateurs in that country and who's, uh, the people that are involved in governance of that society is uh, a very small fraction of that. And they have captive PR people that uh, get their contracts from them and aren't uh, uh, pretty much beholden to them for their contracts. I don't know that you get the best advice sometimes there. I'd really like to see an independent amateur radio organization made up of people that really cared about the future of amateur radio, charting its direction, and uh, maybe taking some new ideas out there about getting people interested, uh, free from the administrative hassles of established, long-established organizations. Uh, Martin, let, let me respond. Go on. Uh, hey, Scott, you need a book of matches? <laughs> I need something bigger, <laughs> Frank. <laughs> uh, because look, I'm, you know, I'm I are one, but they know they can fire me at any time because my my deal with my director is I'm not going to be a sycophant. I'm not going to be a yes person, et cetera, et cetera. And and he understands that. So having said that, as a sociologist who studied organizations for forty some odd years, you're absolutely right. And Martin's absolutely right. National groups like that tend to be elephantine. They are elephants, whereas in the grassroots, there's a lot more innovation. I, I think that's almost a truism there. Certainly that way in the in the technology world, you know, a lot of a lot of grassroots, a lot of disruptive technology. So this group, my voice, ARL, my ARL voice, I think that's what they came came about five or six years ago, and with apologies, I, I will call it a gadfly effort. That is, we don't think that the rules that the, the good old boys and gals uh, who meet in Newington and who want to have staff vote and whatever, uh, and it was that. And you had a couple of 
folks who got elected as division directors because of that uproar. Okay. You can kind of look online and see who they are. And they're very, both very competent. And I've kind of gotten to know one of them. I think she does a, a great job. She's very open, that sort of thing. Well, having said that, Scott, I want to, I want to one up what you're saying and call into question the model of governance. I believe the RSGB of which I'm a, a member, I believe RSGB is governed a little bit the same way, but the ARL came about because of the field service staff to relay messages. We all know that history. Well, is it much more like a feudal system where you've got regional knights and they have their fiefdoms and, and yet they don't have a real king. They elect a president and they hire a CEO. You have people who work at the main office for 30 years and they see directors come and go and it's really their league. Some of those are turning over now. A fair number of them are retiring now. So I'm coming back to your question, why is that the case? Do you try to launch a competitor? Or do you try to change the governance of the current one? And I don't have a real answer for you, Scott. I do know that competition tends to make things better. And for better or worse about CQ Magazine, if, if it ever goes under, it will make QST worse not better. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, but don't you think, guys, that in fairness, and I know what Scott's saying, but if you take, for instance, um, any group of people, there will be some that will just say, I, I, I can tell all my mates I'm on the board or I'm, I'm an area of rep or whatever that particular title is. They're after the title, but they don't really want to do the job or they're not really Bingo. interested. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, or they want to, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the MD or I'm this or I'm that, you know, and that's the problem. We need people that are passionate about it uh, who don't necessarily care about the job title they, they care about the hobby and pushing the hobby forward. And uh, there are people doing that. I'm not saying all, all but, you know, I, I noticed at committee meeting, for argument's sake, our club had a committee meeting the other day. One of the people that joined the committee meeting acknowledged he was there at the start, said nothing the whole evening, and then said good night when it all closed. What's the, what's the use? Uh, title collectors, just like deer hunters, but pardon with apologies to deer hunters, putting heads on walls. Okay. But, but you know, there's, there's, they're, there's scalps and, and this is all terrible metaphors. I apologize, but you know, it's, it's title collecting and it's, it, it's the bane of my ham radio existence as far as my volunteer work. Totally correct. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to say anything on this before we close up? Okay, that looks like uh, Pete, you're being a very good boy today. <laughs> Me getting in trouble. Well, it was tempting, but no, I'll bite the time. <laughs> okay, oh, I'll take one for the team this time, Pete. Okay, listen, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining me tonight on this. I think it's been a, quite a lively discussion. We don't have the answers. Let's be brutally honest about it. We don't have all the answers. We've opened up a can of worms, we've thrown some ideas into the hat, and as everybody, not just the five of us, it's everybody's hobby is in amateur radio, and it's as much yours as mine to try and solve some of these issues and to improve the hobby and promote the hobby. So, uh, yeah, that's where I feel on that one. Okay, I'd like to thank Mr. Frank Howell, K4FMH, for joining us tonight, Frank. That, thanks, Martin, and I'll send you my new address when the league moves me out of my house. That's all right, Frank. You'll be all right. <laughs> I got a room for you, Frank. I got a room for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Scott McDonald, KA9P, for joining us tonight. Thanks, everybody. It was great fun. Yeah, it's great to chat to you again, Scott, and uh, I'll say thanks for coming along uh, for this one. I'd like to thank Mr. Phil Higginbottom, VK6ADF, uh, who must be about four in the morning for you now, Phil, isn't it? Up past four? 
Yeah, half past four. Uh, I'm just deciding now whether, whether I'm going to go back to bed or not. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm quite awake, so I'll probably stay up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you for the invite. Yeah, and thank you for doing it for us, Phil. Most appreciated. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank Pete Sipple, M0PSX, uh, for, for joining us tonight, Pete. And uh, as I say, I'm sure you and I have been caught at various rallies when they start <laughs> opening in the UK, giggling in the corner. <laughs> as we do, as we do. No, it's uh, been a pleasure. It's been uh, really good to kick some ideas around. And uh, uh, I guess if I've got a, a closing comment here, I'd suggest that you know maybe what we need somewhere, uh, I don't know how we do it or who does it, but a collection of all the things that we've done well, uh, some way of sort of sharing successes, a, a repository for that, where if you're stuck for ideas... Uh, we can perhaps share some ideas of things that have worked uh, in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. So uh, I wonder if there's any mileage in just giving that a little bit of thought as a, as a group of radio amateurs listening to this. Yeah, well, it's all, I've always thought food for thought, Pete, and uh, I'm sure sure that made me think a little bit, a bit about things, so I'm sure a lot of people will. Right, well, I know all that's left for me to do is say 73 to you guys, and uh, we'll continue with the podcast. 73, guys. 73. Cheers. 73, cheers. 73. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. Well, welcome back, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed uh, the feature this episode about do we need to rebrand the amateur radio hobby. That was a retake of the uh, talk we gave at the QSO Expo a few weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, as I say, some technical issues, I know the guys were, were struggling uh, with getting a lot of stuff uh, fixed up at the show. We were unable to take the original recording. Uh, so we really do appreciate, uh, as I say, the guys coming back into F4. So that's Scott, KA9, Papa. Pete, Mike Zero, Papa, Sierra X-Ray, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot, Mike Cotel, and Phil, VK6, Alpha, Delta, Foxtrot. So thanks, guys, for uh, coming back and doing that record for us there on, uh, I say, do we need to rebrand our amateur radio hobby? Right, feedback this episode, and uh, this one, unfortunately, Dad was picked up in quite a few places, um, but uh, Michael Her Whiskey Alpha 6, Alpha Romeo Alpha, dropped us a mail uh, on the feedback section, uh, but say so picked up as well on YouTube and other places. Uh, by all counts, uh, there's a, a little bit of a discrepancy about folded dipole lengths in the last episode, so I know you want to clear that one up, a uh, little bit of faux pas, but it proves, Dad, people listen to all the episodes, doesn't it? He certainly does, Colin, and uh, I'm not going to put what I, I'm not going to reply on what I put in the document because uh, we do need our clean rating. But in fairness, uh, thank you, Michael. I do appreciate it. I had what well, I suppose most people would call a brain fart. I just lost that one thing um, when I was recording, and I know it came up on QRZ and a few other places. Yeah. Um, Apologies, guys. I made a mistake, uh, but uh, I'm human. So, uh, but once again, thanks for listening. And if I do make a mistake, point it out to me. I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm just an amateur like the rest of us. So, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks anyway, Michael. I really do appreciate that. Yep. So, do you, do you just want to clarify the math then on that about the folded dipole lamp? Yeah, I had a. I was trying to think that you folded it round. You you had the uh, quarter, the two quarter waves, so you folded them round. But in fact, you end up with two half waves that are folded round, so it isn't any shorter. And but what it does do is it changes the feed point impedance. So um, you end up on a folded dipole of three hundred ohm impedance in at the feed point as opposed to around about 72 on a standard dipole if it's up at the correct height. So, um, yeah, there's lots of information out there on the internet on this. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm glad that some of you come back and told me. I'm also glad that uh, some of you go and check it. So, good. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, no problem. Also, we cleared So, thanks, Michael, for dropping us that line and for everyone else that mentioned it on other forums as well. Now, the DMR group, Dan, I know that's uh, getting quite uh, active. Now, there's more and more people getting involved on that there. And uh, I say yeah, it's great for people to get involved. I know we've got pages on the ICQ podcast website of how people can get involved, but uh, give people a flavour of what's going on on the uh, DMR group. 
Yeah, well, the DMR group has been very, very active since we set it up. Uh, we are still wanting to uh, bridge uh, Fusion and uh, D-Star in as well. That uh, We're waiting for Brandmeister on that one. Uh, at this point in time, and I did a quick few stats a few days ago, at the end of uh, April, the 30th of April, at 5.30 in the morning is when I took the uh, database down the dump, uh, UTC that was, 12,854 ac accesses. Now, I'm going to call them accesses because, all right, some of you just blipped it. Uh, but, um, the, yeah, 12,000 accesses, nearly, nearly 13,000 accesses. Of that, uh, there were a total of 116 different uh, DMR talk group IDs which I'm going to reduce that down to 113 users because I did spot that three of the, uh, three of the IDs belong to um, people who've got two IDs. So let's say 113 different users. The most interesting one is that uh, this is also from 21 countries. And if I look at uh, the, 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 the countries, and I'll be very quick because uh, we're, we're – we're short long on this one. France, Croatia, Serbia, Italy, England, Wales, Scotland, Jersey in the Channel Islands. Uh, we've got Denmark. We've got Ukraine, Poland, Germany, Portugal, Canada, the USA, a lot from the USA, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Peru, and Argentina. So out of the 21 countries, and uh, the, the users are going up because I've spoke to new users since that uh, report, uh, there's a lot happening there, Colin. Yeah, exactly. So it looks like it's uh, a great way of getting in touch. People shows our uh, worldwide uh, audience. And so say, uh, you know, log on anytime during the day. Uh, more importantly, make a call. Don't just blip the, uh, the say, the group. Make a call and uh, say, see what comes back to you. Talking about making a call, one of the uh, wonderful things you can do to help out the ICQ podcast is to make the uh, the call and decision uh, to become a donor of the ICQ podcast. It helps pays our way and keeps us advert free. Uh, the best way you can do it is to go to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate where there's lots of options to get involved. And as always, we'd like to thank our donors this episode. So along with our monthly and subscription donors, we'd like to thank uh, Walt, Kilo Tango Zero Delta, and Andrew Mike Zero X-Ray Zulu Sierra, uh, say, for being donors this episode. So thank many thanks, guys, and many thanks to the subscription donors. Uh, so you help pay our way, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, so we'd also like to thank the guys that joined us on the News Round Table. So Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, and Bill, Whiskey Charlie 3, Bravo, for taking part as in this episode's roundtable. Many thanks, guys, for, uh, say, joining us in that section. Now, Dad mentioned uh, as well this, uh, about the uh, DMR talk group. There are potentially some new updates coming out on that very soon. One of the quickest ways we're going to get that information out to you is via the ICQ podcast, uh, say, newsletter. Uh, so it's a quick way of us getting information out to you when something like that develops. So if you're not part of that uh, newsletter, all you need to do is go to the website as they click on the uh, the subscription buttons. Uh, so they sign up there. The great news is, is we don't sell your, the list or anything like that. It is purely a safe for communicating uh, news information and new releases to you. Uh, so you can get involved in that uh, subscription base. And as I say, the uh, announcements that are hopefully coming soon on DMR will be pushed out to you as quickly uh, as possible. I say, I'll fail you that. I say, we'll, we'll announce them in, the, in an upcoming show when they come available. Right, Dad. Well, I think that, that covers everything, as you say. So a bit of a long show to, uh, this one, but hopefully full of great content for everybody to enjoy. Uh, so uh, you probably need yourself a refreshing cup of tea, not only one for Mrs. B. Uh, but I say, uh, make sure you only give her a, a chucky picky as we, we don't want to be treating you too well. Yeah, well, Mrs. B and me are going to end up having a cup of tea in a minute and uh, I'll find her a nice chockey bicky. And this one could be the first ICQ podcast to go three hours, Colin. <laughs> hi, hi. 
Uh, sadly, no. I think we've had one before in the past. <laughs> but uh, as I say, they don't come regularly. Uh, but as I say, guys, uh, we've always said if we've got great content, it doesn't matter how long the show goes, we'll, uh, we'll give you the content. So uh, look, I hope you're enjoying this one as always, guys. And uh, yeah, let us know your feedback via the usual channels, obviously. So I'm going to bid you and our listeners 73s. And uh, we'll catch up with everyone in a fortnight's time. 73s all. 73. 